Yes. So a very good evening, everyone. So I am myself, Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I am the general medicine educator. So uh, as a part of the remarkable uh, rapid revision of the general medicine, so I have divided the topics of the general medicine into two parts. So part one, that is today, the topics which I'll be discussing will be the quick revision of the endocrinology, then cardiology, then pulmonology, and as well as the nephrology. And uh, let me tell you, like uh, I have already shared the PPT or the PDF without annotations on my Telegram channel, that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. So on this Telegram channel, you have the PDF or the PPT without annotations. So you can join my Telegram channel and download the PPT without annotations, wherein it will be easy for you to write on the PDF with your own handwriting, which becomes very easy for you for the final revision. And uh, the part two of the general medicine, that is tomorrow I'll be discussing these topics, that is neurology and hepatology and gastroenterology, then connective tissue disorders, hematology, and as well as the infectious diseases. So these will be the topics that I'll be discussing tomorrow, right? And tomorrow also I'll be sharing you the PDF without annotations on my Telegram channel, that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba, right? So now before annotations, already I have shared you the PDF or the PPT on my Telegram channel. And once the session is over, I'll be sharing the PDF with annotations on the same Telegram channel that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. And as well as I'll also be sharing on the Dr. Bhanu Prakash uh, Telegram channel as well. So on both of these, you can just download the PDF without with annotations. All right. So having said this, now let us start with the first session because we don't have much time. And because I need to revise a lot many topics in the entire general medicine. So this entire general medicine, I have tried to concise completely into 10 hours. So today the session will be for five hours and tomorrow the session will be for five hours totally. Okay, right. Just give me a minute. Right. Okay. Right. Now let us start with the first topic. Now, what are all the topics that I'll be discussing in the endocrinology will be like the pituitary disorders, then adrenal gland disorders. Then I'll also be discussing the men's syndromes, parathyroid disorders, thyroid disorders, and as well as diabetes mellitus. So these will be the topics which I'll be discussing in the today's session related to your endocrinology. Now, let me first start with the pituitary disorders. In the pituitary disorders, what all the topics will be is, the topics will be like diabetes insipidus, then your syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, right? Then followed by that, we will be discussing the prolactinoma. Okay. And then we will be discussing disorders related to growth hormone. And that is nothing but your acromegaly. And finally, I'll be discussing about the hypopituitarism. So these are the five topics which I'll be discussing in the pituitary disorders. All right. So moving, uh, coming on to the first topic that is diabetes insipidus. Okay. So you have some mixed questions. I have single liner questions. I have image based questions. I have like, uh, uh, you know, the clinical based questions and as well as the theory. So this particular revision session, it will be like combination of all these three, four. That is single liner, image based, clinical based, and as well as the theory aspect of the general medicine. Right. So now can anyone answer this question? Yeah, so I'll be sharing the uh, PDF with annotations as well once the session is over. Right, so gene mutated in the Wolfram syndrome. Any one of you, please? Right, very good. So the answer in this particular question is, that is WFS1. Now, what exactly is this Wolfram syndrome? All that we will try to discuss. Okay, so you take this diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is that clinical scenario which is characterized by either decrease in the antidiuretic hormone, right, or there is ADH receptor resistance, right? There is ADH receptor resistance, okay? That is what is your diabetes insipidus. Now, 
we have two forms of diabetes insipidus. One is your central diabetes insipidus, where there is decrease in the antidiuretic hormone. Whereas the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is that where there is resistance to the antidiuretic hormone. That is what is called as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now you take this, the central diabetes insipidus, what are the important etiologies? The important etiologies for the central diabetes insipidus will be very important cause that is the pituitary adenoma, right? We have some tumors like pituitary adenoma. And the next important tumor will be the craniopharyngioma, right? Next important tumor will be craniopharyngioma. And we also have vascular conditions which will cause central diabetes insipidus. And that particular vascular conditions are Sheehan syndrome, right? Sheehan will be your postpartum hypopituitism, which can cause central diabetes insipidus. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, we mainly have the drugs. And what are the drugs which can cause your nephrogenic diabetes insipidus will be is lithium, which is the drug used in the treatment of bipolar disorder. Then we also have the aminoglycosides, then amphotericin B, right? So can anyone tell me aminoglycosides are active against which group of bacteria? Yes, aminoglycosides are active against which group of bacteria? Yes. So aminoglycosides are active against any one of you? Right, very good. So it is not gram positive, it is they are active against gram negative bacteria. Then coming to the clinical features. So clinical features kya ho sakta hai? The clinical features are like these patients will have the polyuria and as well as the polydipsia. So pishab bhi zada aega, aur dusra cheez hai ki, they will also have the poly dipsia. So there will be excessive thirst. These will be the clinical manifestation in patients with the diabetes insipidus. Then uske baad, like you need to be very much aware of what will be the investigations. So investigations kya ho sakta hai? So the investigations in these individuals with diabetes insipidus is that there will be increase in the serum osmolality. Serum osmolality bad jata hai. Kyun? Right? The reason is because the excess water is excreted out in the form of urine. So the fluid level is reduced. Is liye like serum osmolality bad jata hai. Then urine osmolality kya hoga isme? Urine osmolality kam ho jayega. So there will be decrease in the urine osmolality in these patients. Right? But what is the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice kya ho sakta hai? Investigation of choice jo hai, it is nothing but the water deprivation test. So water deprivation test ka like uh, advantage kya hoga? What is the advantage of water deprivation test? So it helps us in differentiating central diabetes insipidus from nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and it also helps in differentiating diabetes insipidus from psychogenic polydipsia. Ye advantage hai water deprivation test ka. Theke? Then. Then the next important is, what is the drug of choice for central diabetes insipidus? For central diabetes insipidus, kya de sakta hai ya kya dena hai? That is desmopressin. So desmopressin, what are the various routes of administration of the desmopressin? So desmopressin oral bhi de sakte hai, intravenous bhi de sakte hai, inhalation bhi de sakte hai. So these are the various routes of administration of desmopressin. That is intravenous, oral, and as well as the inhalational, okay? And even subcutaneous. Then what is the drug of choice for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? For nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the drug of choice will be thiazide diuretics, okay? So thiazide diuretics, they have the paradoxical action of increased reabsorption of water from proximal convoluted tubule whenever you give in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So thiazide diuretics ka like uh, matlab kya hai? Why are we giving this? Because us, un, uh, thiazide diuretics ko like paradoxical action raega. Kya paradoxical action? There will be increased water reabsorption from the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay. Then what is the drug of choice for lithium induced diabetes insipidus? Kya hoga? Right, anyone? So, for lithium induced diabetes insipidus, the drug of choice is the amyloride. Right, the drug of choice is amyloride. Okay, and differential diagnosis of diabetes insipidus kya ho sakta hai? Differential diagnosis jo hai, it is psychogenic polydipsia. Right, psychogenic polydipsia. So that will be the differential diagnosis for the diabetes insipidus, all right? So this is in nutshell about your diabetes insipidus. Now, the point is like, I have given you three important clinical scenarios, right? So I'll be teaching both. I'll be teaching in English and as well as the English totally, okay? 
right so please tell me like i have given you three clinical scenarios that is a, we have three patients who presented with polyuria and as well as polydipsia and my unka urine osmolality on serum osmolality dono check kiya hai right first patient ka like jo hai first patient ka jo serum osmolality jo hai bad gaya serum osmolality of the first patient is more but urine osmolality is decreased so can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of the first patient yes first patient ka diagnosis kya ho sakta hai what will be the diagnosis of the first patient this is nothing but your diabetes insipidus second patient ka jo hai like dono decrease hai serum osmolality bhi kam hai with polyuria polydipsia and at the same time even the urine osmolality is also decreased kya ho sakta hai what would be the second patient the second patient jo hai it is nothing but psychogenic polydipsia right psychogenic polydipsia so what i want to tell you is in psychogenic polydipsia dono kam rahega right that is your serum and as well as urine osmolality third patient ka jo clinical scenario jo hai serum osmolality normal ya increase hai and urine osmolality bad gaya right urine osmolality is increased so can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of the third clinical scenario third clinical scenario what is the diagnosis kya ho sakta hai very good so that will be diabetes mellitus so why is that urine osmolality is increased that is because in patients with diabetes mellitus there is increase in glucose secretion glucose excretion in the urine so that is the reason why in case of diabetes mellitus the urine osmolality is increased all right so these are the three clinical scenarios that you need to be very much clear and so these three in which patients you are doing you are doing in patients with polyuria and as well as polydipsia all right so that was about your diabetes insipidus okay so this is one of the clinical question from your diabetes insipidus a 33 year old lady presented with polydipsia polyuria her symptoms started soon after a road traffic accident 6 months ago the blood pressure is 120 by 80 with no postural drop daily urine output is 6 to 8 liters investigation showed sodium 130 potassium 3.5 urea 15 sugars are 65 mg per deciliter the plasma osmolality is 268 mol per liter urine osmolality is 45 mol per liter and what is the most likely diagnosis in this patients any one of you most likely diagnosis in this clinical scenario right so please remember the answer is psychogenic polydipsia why because if you observe the urine osmolality ka normal kya uh, normal value kya hoga urine osmolality normal value is 100 to 900 milliosmoles right and serum osmolality normal value this will be 285 to 295 milliosmoles okay so you take the serum osmolality 268 it is reduced urine osmolality 45 it is also reduced so you will have that in patients with psychogenic polydipsia right so that was completely about your diabetes insipidus and one image based question on diabetes insipidus name the channels on which the adh act aquaporin 1 aquaporin 2 aquaporin 3 and aquaporin 4 any one of you yes what are the channels on which this particular anti diuretic hormone acts any one of you please right so it is the aquaporin 2 channels so and where are these aquaporin 2 channels present these aquaporin 2 channels that will be formed on the collecting duct by the action of your anti diuretic hormone on the v2 receptors okay so that was about one of the image based question on diabetes insipidus so diabetes insipidus ho gaya hai now we will move on to the next topic that is sadh syndrome of inappropriate anti diuretic hormone so isme kya hoga there will be increased levels of the anti diuretic hormone so can anyone answer this question what is the true statement about your the sadh anyone very good so ye sadh mein the individual will be having the euvolemic hyponatremia right they will not have hypervolemic hyponatremia hyponatremia to zarur hoga magar ye euvolemic hai ya hypervolemic hai this will be euvolemic hyponatremia now what are the conditions where you will have hypervolemic hyponatremia you will have that in patients with the congestive heart failure you will have that in patients with cirrhosis of liver and you will have that in patients with chronic renal failure okay these are the conditions where you will have hypervolemic hyponatremia now let me discuss about the sadh right syndrome of inappropriate anti diuretic hormone so isme kya hoga these patients they will have increased production of anti diuretic hormone so there is 
because of this there is increased water reabsorption right because of this there is increased water reabsorption so water absorption zyada ho jayega so isliye fluid volume kya hoga hamara body mein bad jayega so jab bhi agar fluid volume bad gaya whenever there is increase in the fluid volume in our body immediately there is activation of the compensatory mechanisms compensatory mechanisms activate hoga इसलिए ये जो फ्लूड वॉल्यूम जो ज्यादा है वो बाहर एक्सक्रीट करने के लिए ये कॉम्पेंसेटरी मैकेनिज्म एक्टिवेट होगा सो द कॉम्पेंसेटरी मैकेनिज्म आर एक्टिवेटेड टू एक्सक्रीट द फ्लूड आउट एंड व्हाट विल बी दैट कॉम्पेंसेटरी मैकेनिज्म दैट विल बी इनिबिशन ऑफ योर रास राइट एंड देयर विल बी इंक्रीज्ड रिलीज ऑफ द एट्रियल न्यूट्रियोरिटिक पेप्टाइड and there will be also inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system activity these three are the compensatory mechanisms which gets activated all right now you should know what is the common malignancy which is associated with the development of the sadh the common malignancy that will be your small cell carcinoma of the lung so small cell carcinoma of the lung it is also nothing but the oat cell carcinoma that is the one which is associated with the sadh and not only that we also have some drugs which are associated with the development of sadh and that particular drug is will be vincristin right vincristin and we also have the oral hypoglycemic agents that is chlorpropamide so what is chlorpropamide any one of you yes what is chlorpropamide so chlorpropamide it is nothing but a first generation sulfonyl urea all right and we also have some neurological conditions which are associated with the development of sadh and that particular neurological conditions will be your glenbarry syndrome and then amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and then chronic meningitis so these are the conditions where you have the development of sadh now because of the activation of these compensatory mechanisms like what will be the clinical features so please remember all these compensatory mechanisms will see that the sodium is excreted out and water is also excreted out so the clinical features that you will have is mainly because of the hyponatremia so what will be the clinical features due to hyponatremia the clinical features due to hyponatremia will be like altered sensorium these patients will also have seizures these patients will have the features of raised intracranial pressure they may land up in coma and death okay and Uh, the blood pressure of these individuals will be absolutely normal hmm? blood pressure will be absolutely normal okay and there is no ascites in these individuals ascites nahi rahega isme and at the same time there is also no pedal edema so ascites bhi nahi rahega and pedal edema also will not be there in these patients now investigation sa ya work up kya hoga isme please remember the investigations include that serum sodium levels will be reduced and what will happen to serum osmolality yes serum osmolality be kam ho jayega then what will happen to the urine osmolality urine osmolality bad jayega kyun because there is increase in the urinary sodium so isliye the urine osmolality urine sodium be bad jayega magar investigation of choice kya hoga isme investigation of choice in patients with the sadh is the water loading test right water loading test then iske baad you need to know first line treatment so kya ho sakta hai what may be the first line treatment yes what may be the first line treatment first line treatment jo hai in these individuals it is the fluid restriction right the fluid restriction okay right and you need to give 800 ml to 1000 ml per 24 hours right 800 ml to 1000 ml per 24 hours water restriction is the first line treatment right now in what is the drug of choice in these patients the drug of choice will be vaptans right drug of choice will be vaptans that will be your conivaptan and as well as tolvaptan and in patients with symptomatic hyponatremia you need to give 3% sodium chloride okay in patients with symptomatic hyponatremia you need to give 3% sodium chloride okay so this is about syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone okay right so because this is being a quick revision session right uh, it becomes slightly difficult to take up the doubts also in between but i have my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh gupta any doubts that you have in this session you can just post me on my telegram channel okay
uh, there are a lot of ads which are coming in between. Okay, right. So because it being a completely a revision session, thoda difficult hoga doubts lene ke liye. Isliye le jo bhi doubts, whatever the doubts you get, you can post me on my Telegram channel that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. Definitely, I will take your questions on my Telegram channel and I will revert back to you as well. Okay, right. Then after having discussed about the SADH, now we will move on to the next topic. So can anyone tell me like uh, what will be the answer to this question? So we have a 35 year old female presented with one year history of menstrual irregularity and galacturia. She also has on and off a headache. Her examination reveals bitemporal superior quadrant and opia. Fundus examination showed primary optic atrophy. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this case? Kya ho sakta hai? So is my voice clear? Am I audible properly or is there any echo? Any one of you, please? Please answer in the comment section. Right. So what will be the answer? Very good. So the answer in this question is the pituitary macroadenoma. And this is nothing but your prolactinoma. Right, this is nothing but the prolactinoma. Right, so what will be the next topic for the discussion now? The next topic for the discussion will be your prolactinoma. Now, you take this prolactinoma. So, this prolactinoma it is in two sizes. We have the microadenoma, where the size of the tumor is less than 10 mm, then macroadenoma, where the size of the tumor is more than 10 mm. This may do no difference. Kya hoga? So, microadenoma. May Kali endocrine manifestations see Raiga. Bagar macro adenoma may endocrine manifestations ke saad saad, there will be also mass effect on the surrounding structures. So in micro adenoma, you will have only endocrine manifestations, whereas in macro adenoma, along with endocrine manifestations, you also have the mass effect on the surrounding structures. Now, what are the physiological causes for hyperprolactinemia? So physiological causes for hyperprolactinemia will be number one. Pregnancy is one important condition. Then lactation is another important condition. Then sleep, that is REM sleep, right? And then stress, okay? And then the nipple stimulation. So these are the endocrine condition, I mean, physiological conditions. What are the pathological conditions? The pathological conditions will be like prolactinoma. And we have another tumor that is craniopharyngioma. Right, craniopharyngioma. And we also have some systemic conditions. What are those systemic conditions? That will be chronic renal failure and then cirrhosis of liver. Okay. And then we also have some drugs. What are those drugs? These drugs are those which will antagonize the dopamine, which are nothing but your dopamine antagonist. What are the dopamine antagonists? That includes your metaclopramide. That includes your simetidine. That includes your alpha methyl dopa. These are the drugs which will cause hyperprolactinemia. Now, what will be the clinical features in females? Jo endocrine manifestations jo bhi hai, in females, they will have amenorrhea, Right, and then they also have excessive lactation that is lac galactoria. Okay, so excessive lactation, which is nothing but your galactoria. And the next important is these patients will have the infertility, right? Infertility, and in males, what will be the manifestations? They also will have infertility because of decrease in spermatogenesis, and at the same time, there will be also. Decrease in libido, that is because of decrease in the testosterone production. Now, what will be the mass effect in these patients with the prolactinoma? That will be bitemporal superior quadrant anopia. Okay. And this bitemporal superior quadrant anopia will progress to bitemporal hemi anopia. So, this will be the mass effect manifestations. Now, what will be the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice, Johe. That is estimation of the serum prolactin level. And how much that should be? That should be more than 
200 micrograms per deciliter in case of prolactinoma. Normal levels kya hoga? Normal levels jo hai, it is around 5 to 20 micrograms per deciliter. So normal levels of your prolactin is 5 to 20 micrograms per deciliter. But whereas in prolactinoma, ye 200 so zyada raiga. It will be more than 200. Then you need to do MRI. What is the purpose of doing MRI? That is mainly to make out whether it is microadenoma or the macroadenoma. Then what will be the first line treatment in these patients? The first line treatment in these patients is you need to give a dopamine agonist. And that particular dopamine agonist that we give is bromocryptin. So bromocryptin is considered as the drug of choice. But the bromocryptin is considered as the drug of choice in pregnancy. Okay, so in pregnancy, the bromocryptin is the drug of choice. Whereas in non-pregnant individual or in males, the drug of choice will be cabergoline. Okay, the drug of choice will be cabergoline. And one point you should remember is that with dopamine agonist, if the individual is refractory, then you need to do transphenoidal pituitary adenectomy. All right, now you answer this question. Following procedure is useful in the treatment of. So what exactly is this procedure? This procedure is nothing but transphenoidal pituitary adenectomy. So is it, done, is it done for micro? Is it done for macro? Is it done for both or hypothalamic tumors? Any one of you, please? So please remember this particular procedure is done for both micro and as well as macro if the prolactin levels are not reduced, right? So whenever you are giving bromocryptin or cabergoline, the prolactin levels has to get normalized after three to six months. If the prolactin levels are not getting normalized, ye jo micro bhi hoga ya macro bhi hoga, dono mein we do transphenoidal pituitary adenectomy, all right? And those students who are just joined now, let me tell you, the PDF without annotations or the PPT without annotations is available on my Telegram channel that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. And immediately after the session with annotations, I'll be sending you on my same Telegram channel that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. Okay, now, so after a discussion about the prolactin, now let me discuss about the points related to growth hormone. Just give me one minute. Right, so. Yes, so can anyone answer this? Which is not the side effect of the growth hormone administration? Gynecomastia, hypoglycemia, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, and then pseudotumor cerebri. Any one of you? Right, so the answer Yes, so they will not have hypoglycemia. Growth hormone administration dene ke wajay se, there will be hyperglycemia, but not the hypoglycemia, all right? Now, let me discuss the disorders related to growth hormone. So that is acromegaly. So acromegaly is the clinical condition which is characterized by increase in growth hormone in adults. Now, for the development of acromegaly, what is the etiology? The etiology is somatotroph type of the pituitary adenoma. Right, and if you take this somatotroph type of pituitary adenoma, that is also depending upon the size we have micro and macro adenoma. But between these two, which is more common? So, macro adenoma is more common than compared to that of the micro adenoma. Now, what all will be the clinical features that you come across in patients with your acromegaly? The skeletal manifestations, if you observe, that will be in the form of your if you take the head of these individuals, okay, so there will be gross facial features. Right, so they will be having the frontal bosing, right? And if you observe the nose, so there will be a broad nose in these individual. And if you observe the jaw, so there will be 
prognathism in these patients where there will be protrusion of the jaw. Okay, so these will be the manifestations within the face. And how will be the hands in these individuals? So there will be hands like with swollen fingers. That is the reason why these patients, right? That is the reason why these patients will have the increase in the ring size. And even if you take the hands, they're like broad hands. So that is the reason why if you take the glove size is also increased. And even you take the foot in these individuals, the foot, if you observe, they will have a broad foot, right? And because of which what has been described is the shoe size is also increased. And the next important is the joint manifestations and the joint manifestations will be in the form of arthritis. So that will be the skeletal manifestations in these patients. Now, what will be the soft tissue manifestations? The soft tissue manifestations in these individuals is that there will be organomegaly. So there will be increase in the foot pad thickness. Okay. And even the skin thickness will be increased. And in the skin, you have the sweat glands. There will be hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the sweat glands. Thereby, the individual will have profuse sweating. And organomegaly, if you observe, there will be increase in the size of the liver, hepatomegaly. Increase in the size of the spleen, that is splenomegaly. Increase in the size of the thyroid, that is thyroid enlargement. And increase in the size of the tongue. And because of increase in the size of the tongue, these patients can develop obstructive sleep apnea. All right. Then you take the CNS manifestations. The CNS manifestations in these individuals will be mass effect on the surrounding structures. And there will be compression on... Okay, so there will be compression on the optic asthma that will be causing visual changes. That is your bitemporal hemianopia. And abnormal metabolisms, there will be increase in the glucose level in these patients, right? There will be dyslipidemia in these patients. Okay, and you also have what is called mammosomatotroph type of pituitary adenoma. In case of mammosomatotroph type of pituitary adenoma, is kya hoga in females with mammosomatotroph type of pituitary adenoma? they will have amenorrhea, right? And they will also have galactoria, right? They will also have galactoria. Then what is the cause of death in these patients? The cause of death in patients with your acromegaly will be your congestive heart failure. That would be the cause of death. So what will be the cardiac manifestations? The cardiac manifestations will be in the form of the hypertension. There can be development of left ventricular hypertrophy and there can be also development of the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. All right. Then what will be the first line investigation that you will come across in these individuals? First line investigations, Johe, that is nothing but increase in the somatomedin levels. Right. And what are your somatomedins? That is IGF-1. So IGF-1 levels are elevated. Then what is your investigation of choice? Investigation of choice will be the growth hormone suppression test. Okay. That is the failure of the growth hormone suppression in spite of the glucose load. So this we also call it as the glucose tolerance test or glucose loading test. Okay. Then what will be the first line treatment? See, prolactinoma first line treatment is we were giving dopamine agonist. But here, the first line treatment in these individuals is surgical resection. So, is my first line treatment kya karna hai? Surgical resection karna hai. So, what will be that surgical resection? That will be transphenoidal pituitary adenectomy karna hai. Then, agar surgery is like contraindicated. Agar patient bol rahe ki mere paas paise nahi hai surgery karne ke liye, then what is the drug of choice? So, drug of choice, if the individual is not willing for surgery or if there is any contraindication for surgery, that will be your somatostatin analog and that particular somatostatin analog is octreotide. Right? That will be octreotide. Then what is your second line agent? Right? What is your second line agent? Second line agent is pegvisomant. So pegvisomant, it will not reduce the growth hormone level, but it will normalize your IGF-1 level, which is nothing but your somatomedin. Right? And if the individual is refractory to surgical treatment, and if the individual is not responding to your medical management, then what is the treatment option that we have? The treatment option that we have is radiotherapy. So this is about your acromegaly, done, ho gaya. Then we will see some of the images in the acromegaly. So in case of acromegaly, whenever you take the X-ray of the digits, 
you will notice the isolated spade shaped phalanx that is a characteristic feature in patients with the acromegaly then you take the x ray of the foot in the lateral view when you take the x ray of the foot in the lateral view what is that you will observe is there is increase in the heel pad thickness normal value kitna hai normal value jo hai that is around 13 to 21 in these individuals with acromegaly there is increase in the heel pad thickness okay that is what is a very important image right so these are the images of your acromegaly and theory aspect of the acromegaly now we'll move on to the next topic right yes can anyone answer this question levels of which hormone is likely to increase after hypothalamic ablation any one of you levels of which particular hormone increases after hypothalamic ablation very good so that is your prolactin level Why? because hypothalamus when you ablate the dopamine levels come ho jayega so jab bhi agar dopamine levels come hoga prolactin levels kya hoga prolactin levels bad jayega theek hai right and whereas your growth hormone levels fsh and ACTH, all of them will be reduced. Now, we will discuss the next important topic that is hyperpituitism. Now, the first question in hyperpituitism is what is the first hormone that is being reduced in patients with hyperpituitism? That will be your growth hormone. So, growth hormone pele kam ho jayega. Growth hormone kam hone ke baad, what are the next hormone that will be reduced? There will be decrease in your FSH and as well as the LH. Then subsequently, the other hormones will be reduced. Then what is the most common cause? Most common cause, kya hoga hypopituitism develop hone ke liye? That would be your pituitary adenoma. Right? That would be your pituitary adenoma. So pituitary adenoma ke next, what is your pituitary apoplexy? Pituitary apoplexy, it is the infarction or it is hemorrhagic infarction of Right, hemorrhagic infarction of the pre existing pituitary adenoma that is what is called pituitary apoplexy. And this pituitary apoplexy it is a very important neurological emergency. Right, ye patients ko bought severe headache raiga, and immediately the new neurosurgeon has to intervene. This then, what are the inflammatory causes that can cause hypopituitarism? That will be your non caseating granuloma that will accumulate in the pituitary, that is your sarcoidosis. Right, then caseating granuloma that will accumulate in the pituitary that will be your tuberculosis. And clinical features, kya hoga? clinical features completely depends upon which hormone is being reduced. Right, is it growth hormone reduced? The individual will have like dwarfism if it is in children. Is it like LH and FSH reduced? The individual will have the sexual disturbances. If the TSH is reduced, they'll have hypothyroidism. If ACTH is reduced, they'll have adenocortical insufficiency. All right. So that will be the clinical features. Now, in order to estimate the ACTH levels, ACTH levels directly hum test nahi kar sakte. Why? We cannot test the ACTH levels directly. Why? Because the ACTH which is being produced from the anterior pituitary, it is in episodic fashion. That is the reason why you need to do what is called metirapone test. So whenever you give metirapone, in a normal individual, whenever you give metirapone in a normal individual, ACTH levels badna hai, right? In spite of giving metirapone, if the ACTH level is not increasing, then we need to suspect hypopituitism. Okay. Then next is your growth hormone levels. Growth hormone levels also you should not test directly. Why? Because growth hormone be kaise release hoga? In episodic fashion, growth hormone will be released. So, isli hum growth hormone test karne ke liye, we use what is called arginine infusion test. Right? Arginine infusion test. And other hormones jo hai, TSH, LH and FSH. Ye jo hormones jo hai, directly hum test kar sakte hai. Right? Because they don't have this episodic release nature. Then drug of choice kya hoga? Can anyone tell me what is the first drug that you will administer? Right. What is the first drug that you will administer? What is the drug of choice? Any one of you? Yeah, I'm teaching in both English and English. Don't know. Uh, it is not dexamethasone. The drug of choice in these individuals will be hydrocortisone. Right? The drug of choice will be hydrocortisone. Because this particular hydrocortisone, it has a dual activity. It has the steroid activity and mineralocorticoid activity. That is the reason why the hydrocortisone is considered as the drug of choice. The first drug 
I mean, I want to tell you like that is the first drug that you need to administer because without steroid, the patient cannot survive. Right, that is the reason why the steroid has to be supplemented first. Okay, so that was about your hypopituitarism. Now we will take one clinical question related to the. Okay, yes, answer this question. A seventy-five-year-old man presents with development of the abdominal obesity, proximal myopathy, skin hyperpigmentation. His laboratory evaluation shows hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Cushing syndrome is suspected. Which of the following statement in this patient is true? So as I have said you, it's a mixture here, dono. You have single liner questions, you have image based questions, you have theory part of it, and you also have a clinical based questions, right? Any one of you, please. Pushing syndrome is suspected. Which of the following statements is true? So when I, in jabbi agar question me, if it whenever the question says hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Along with that, Cushing syndrome. First, think of ectopic ACTH. Right? First, think of the ectopic ACTH. Okay? Right? So, among the options which has been given to you, basal ACTH is low, is wrong. Because ectopic ACTH, there will be excess ACTH production. Right? CRH levels elevated. Nine. So, whenever the ACTH levels is increased in ectopic ACTH, CRH will be decreased. And pituitary MRI will visualize the ACTH secreting tumors. No, because ectopic ACTH cannot be detected by your pituitary MRI. So your C is also a wrong statement. What are the sources of ectopic ACTH? Small cell carcinoma of the lung, pancreatic and bronchial carcinoid, then pheochromocytoma. These are all the sources for ectopic ACTH. Right, so C is also wrong statement. Referral for urgent performance of inferior petrosal sinus sampling. No, inferior petrosal sinus sampling is being done in case of ACTH dependent type of Cushing's. That is in case of pituitary adenoma. But here we are suspecting ectopic ACTH. So inferior petrosal sinus sampling will not be the best one. So the serum potassium level less than 3.3 is suggestive of ectopic ACTH. So please remember, jab bhi agar Cushing syndrome mein uh, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis is there. If at all, when there is hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis in Cushing's, you need to suspect ectopic ACTH production, right? Now, let me discuss in detail about the Cushing's. So, you have two terms. One is Cushing's syndrome and then Cushing's disease. Cushing's syndrome means all the etiologies, whichever are causing the Cushing's. ACTH dependent bhi ho sakta, ACTH independent bhi ho sakta. Either it is ACTH dependent or ACTH independent. Whereas Cushing's disease, it will be the central pathology, right? And what will be that central pathology? That central pathology is your pituitary adenoma. That is your Cushing's disease. So what is the most common cause of Cushing's? The most common cause of the Cushing's will be the iatrogenic cause, right? And most common cause of non iatrogenic Cushing's or ACTH dependent, that will be pituitary adenoma, right? That will be your pituitary adenoma. Okay, then what is the most common cause of ACTH independent type of Cushing's? That will be adrenal adenoma. Now, a quick question for all of you is, what is the most common cause of ectopic ACTH production? Any one of you? Most common cause of the ectopic ACTH production. Yes, who will be the first person to answer this question? So, the most common cause of ectopic ACTH will be small cell carcinoma of the lung, which is also called oat cell carcinoma. All right. Then, what will be the earliest clinical manifestations in Cushing's? That will be weight gain. And because of weight gain, there will be like central obesity. And this central obesity is the one that will be responsible for the insulin resistance. Right, that will be responsible for insulin resistance. Okay, then what are the dermatological manifestations? These patients they will have the purple stray, and not only the purple stray, they will also have the easy bruisability. Right, they will all they are more prone for fungal infections. And what are the fungal infections which are very common? That is Thenia versicola and as well as the Candida infection. And they also have the hyperpigmentation. But in which type of Cushing's you have hyperpigmentation that is ACTH dependent type of Cushing's that is pituitary adenoma and as well as ectopic ACTH you have the uh, hyperpigmented skin. And if you take the abnormal metabolism in patients with the Cushing's, there will be increase in the free fatty acids because of excessive lipolysis. 
and there will be also increase in glucose level because of increase in hepatic gluconeogenesis. And the next important is there will be proteolysis and that will cause the proximal myopathy in these patients. And if you take the bone also in these individuals, there will be osteoporosis. Right? There will be osteoporosis. That is because of inhibition of the bone formation. And cardiovascular manifestations will be in the form of hypertension. And neurological manifestation will be in the form of psychosis or emotional instability. Right? Then what will be the first line investigation? You need to do 24-hour urinary levels of the cortisol. So 24-hour urinary cortisol levels you need to do. See, previously we were doing uh, we were doing like overnight dexamethasone suppression test. Please remember now it is 24-hour urinary levels of your cortisol. If it is being elevated, then you need to estimate the ACTH levels. If at all, if the ACTH levels are elevated, right, then what is the investigation of choice or what is the first line investigation if the ACTH levels are elevated? Then you need to do MRI of the pituitary in order to look for the pituitary adenoma. If suppose if MRI is normal, then we do high dose dexamethasone suppression test. Okay. Then what is the first line treatment in these patients? The first line treatment in these patients is that you need to do surgical resection of the tumor, right? And if suppose if there is contraindication for surgery, then you need to give the medical management. What is the drug of choice in these individuals? The drug of choice in these patients will be ketoconazole. So ketoconazole, it is considered as the drug which causes medical adrenalectomy, right? What is the mechanism of action? It is an adrenal enzyme inhibitor. And that is the reason why we give ketoconazole, all right? Then we have one clinical, uh, I mean, image-based question. So these are the purple stray. And why will this purple stray develop? This purple stray is mainly because of excessive stretching of the skin. And then you have this hyperpigmented skin. And that is because of the ACTH dependent type of Cushing's. There will be excessive melanocyte stimulating hormone. And that is the reason why you will have the hyperpigmented skin. All right. And in case of the Cushing's, whenever you do a bilateral adenolectomy, right? Whenever you do a bilateral adenolectomy, Right. Whenever you do bilateral adenolectomy, please remember what these patients can develop is these patients can develop what is called Nelson syndrome. Right. These patients can develop what is called Nelson syndrome. Now, what is this Nelson syndrome? Nelson syndrome is that whenever you do bilateral adenolectomy, the steroid level reduces. Once the steroid levels reduces, the ACTH increases. And along with that, MSH increases. When the MSH increases, there will be hyperpigmented skin. And that is what is nothing but your Nelson syndrome. And this is the recent INICT uh, question, which was asked in November 2023. All right. Next. Yes, all are true about the condition shown, except. Yes, all are true about the condition shown, except hyperpigmentation, hyperkalemia, purple stray, and metabolic alkalosis. So. The answer in this question is hyperkalemia will not be there. So what is that these patients will have is your hypokalemia. So hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. So what is this? This is your buffalo hump, which is seen in patients with the Cushing's, right? And this is what is nothing but your striae, purple striae, mainly seen over the abdomen, right? That is even over the flanks and as well as over the umbilicus. So that was about your Cushing syndrome, right? Now we will move on to the next topic. Cushing's is done. Over. Now, testing for primary hyperaldosteronism should be done for all the hypertensive patients except. Yes. So what is your primary hyperaldosteronism? That is nothing but your Kahn syndrome. So I'll be discussing the Kahn syndrome now. Any one of you? Yeah. So yes. Uh, Naveen, why they will have hypokalemia is because in patients with the Cushing's, there is excess steroids. That excess steroids will go and activate the ENAC channels, the epithelial sodium channels. And because of excessive activation of ENAC channels, there will be sodium and water retention and potassium excretion resulting in hypokalemia. Okay. Right. Any one of you? Okay. The answer in this question is B. See, in patients with the hyperaldosteronism, 
it is one of the cause for secondary hypertension. So sustained hypertension can be there on three different days. It can be. And it is one of the cause for resistant hypertension because in hyperaldosteronism, you need to give the antihypertensive as aldosterone antagonist. Instead of aldosterone antagonist, like for example, you are giving beta blocker or you are giving alpha blocker or you are giving a loop diuretic, the blood pressure will not reduce. Okay. And control blood pressure requiring four or more antihypertensives is also a correct statement. But in patients with hyper hyperaldosteronism, hyperkalemia nahi raega. These patients will have the hypokalemia. Now, let me discuss about the Kohn syndrome. So, Kohn syndrome, it is a clinical condition which is characterized by increase in the aldosterone levels. Right? Which is characterized by increase in aldosterone levels. And what is the most common cause of the hyperaldosteronism? That will be bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. That will be the most common cause for Kohn syndrome, right? And what is the most common cause for your cons? Please remember, most common cause of hyperaldosteronism will be your bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. But most common cause of Kohn syndrome will be the adrenal adenoma, right? That will be adrenal adenoma. So you have to remember that only for adrenal adenoma, we use this word called cons, right? And if you take the clinical features in these patients, they will have diastolic hypertension because of increased sodium and water retention, but these patients will not have edema. And these patients will have the polyuria and these patients will have the polydipsia, right? And these patients, because of hypokalemia, they will have severe metabolic, because of hypokalemia, they'll have severe muscle weakness, right? They will have severe muscle weakness, okay? And what does the ABG show? ABG will show you that there is metabolic alkalosis because your H plus ion is excreted out. That is the reason why there will be metabolic alkalosis. Now, aldosterone escape phenomenon is that in spite aldosterone is more, the sodium and water retention does not occur. And that is called aldosterone escape phenomenon. Then what is the first line investigation or the screening test in patients with the PONS is the aldosterone renin ratio. So if you take this aldosterone renin ratio in patients with primary hyperaldosteronism, it is increased. I'm not talking about secondary. In primary, it is increased. And what is the investigation of choice in patients with your primary? That is oral salt solution test. Right? Oral salt solution test. Okay? That will be the investigation of choice. Then what is the first line treatment that you need to do in these patients is the surgical resection of the tumor. That is the First line treatment that you will be doing in case of the Kohn syndrome or hyperaldosteronism. But if there is bilateral adrenal tumor, you should not do surgical resection. What is that you will do? If there is bilateral adrenal tumor, you need to give aldosterone antagonist that is spironolactone should be given. So spironolactone, right? Spironolactone will cause the tender gynecomastia is one of the important adverse effects. So the alternative will be the eplerinone should be given. Okay, and the next important is differential diagnosis of your Kohn syndrome. Differential diagnosis of the Kohn syndrome is Liddell syndrome, where there is gain of function of epithelial sodium channel, and it is an autosomal dominant type of inheritance. Gain of function of epithelial sodium channel, and what is the drug that you'll be giving in case of Liddell syndrome is we give amyloride, we give ENAC blocker, epithelial sodium channel blocker. And that epithelial sodium channel blocker will be your amyloride or we have an alternative drug that is triamterene. Okay. So this will be the treatment for your Kohn syndrome. So with this, we are done with the Kohn syndrome. All right. Now, after having discussed about the cons, right, let me just ask you one important question here. Related to, yes, you just see, this is the recent INICT question. A known rheumatoid arthritis patient presented to the emergency department with hypotension. She was on medication for rheumatoid arthritis treatment, but abruptly stopped the medication. Heart rate 110, blood pressure 80 by 40, blood sugar 50, sodium 130, potassium 6. What should be the most appropriate management? Fast IV fluids, hydrocortisone, dopamine infusion, soda bicarbonate. Can anyone answer this question? This is the recent INICT question which was asked in the month of November 2023. 
All right, very good. So the answer is hydrocortisone. See, what is the treatment that you will give in case of rheumatoid arthritis is that steroids. Actually, we give steroids only in case of acute conditions. We don't give steroids in chronic. In chronic, what we give is your DMARDs, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. All right. So the hydrocortic, I mean, if these particular steroids are stopped abruptly, these patients will develop adenocortical insufficiency. So for adenocortical insufficiency, the drug that you need to give is the hydrocortisone. So now let me discuss about the Addison's. So this particular Addison's or adenocortical insufficiency, we have two forms. One is your primary and the other one is secondary adenocortical insufficiency. So you take primary adenocortical insufficiency. Primary adenocortical insufficiency is that where we use the term Addison's. In primary, all the hormones are reduced in the adrenal cortex. Steroids are reduced. Aldosterone is reduced. Weak sex hormones are also reduced in case of primary. Whereas in secondary, the problem is not in the adrenal gland. The problem is in the anterior pituitary. That is the reason why in secondary, only corticosteroids and weak sex hormones are reduced. Whereas aldosterone levels in case of secondary will be absolutely normal. Okay. Now, what is the most common cause of Addison's in India? That is tuberculosis. And what is the most common cause of Addison's in the West? That is autoimmune adrenalitis. Okay. And most common virus that will be causing Addison's will be cytomegalovirus. And most common fungal infections that will be causing Addison's will be the histoplasmosis. And adrenomyeloleukodystrophy, it is an X-linked disorder, which is more commonly observed in males rather than females. Right, And in these individuals, there is excessive accumulation of the free fatty acids within the adrenal gland causing the Addison's. And waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome is that where there is abrupt adrenocortical insufficiency. Right, Abrupt adrenocortical insufficiency. And what is the organism that will be causing your, uh, your waterhouse Fredrickson's? That will be Neisseria meningitidis. Right, which is nothing but meningococci. And these patients will have vascular collapse and as well as death of the individual. And this is very common in children after the viral infections. And what will be the drug of choice in these individuals? The drug of choice in these patients will be hydrocortisone. All right, then. So these patients, in case of the primary, in what did I tell you? In case of primary, all these will be deficient, steroid, aldosterone, and as well as weak sex hormone. Whereas in secondary, the aldosterone levels, it will remain normal. In secondary, the aldosterone levels will remain normal. Now, if you take the clinical features in these patients, because of steroid deficiency, these patients will have the hypoglycemia. And these patients will have the fatigue. And these patients will also have the weight loss. And because of aldosterone deficiency, these patients will have the postural hypotension, right? These patients will have the postural hypotension and these patients will also have the hyponatremia and these patients will have the hyperkalemia and these patients will have the acidosis. And weak sex hormone deficiency can also be there in these individuals and because of which there will be loss of libido and these patients will also have infertility in patients with the weak sex hormone deficiency. And you take the pigmentation. Pigmentation will be there only in case of primary. That is because of increase in the MSH level. And whereas in secondary, they will have hypopigmentation because in secondary, there will be decrease in the MSH level. And that hypopigmented skin, we call this as the alabaster skin. Right, we call this as <laughs> alabaster skin. Okay, so this is about your Addison's. So, what is the difference in primary? I, did, I have said you the aldosterone levels will be reduced in primary, whereas aldosterone levels will be normal in secondary, whereas steroid and weak sex hormone deficiency will be there in both. And what is the investigation of choice in these individuals? Investigation of choice will be posyntopin test, which is also called as the ACTH stimulation test. Okay, now what is the drug of choice for primary adenocortical insufficiency? That will be your hydrocortisone. And drug of choice for secondary adenocortical insufficiency? That is dexamethasone. And what is the drug of choice for waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome? That is intravenous hydrocortisone should be given. Whereas in primary, what we give is oral hydrocortisone. And waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome is caused by your Neisseria meningitis. That is the reason why we also need to give intravenous ceftriaxone should be given. 
And along with that, you need to supplement dextrose and as well as IV fluids. So that was about your Addison's and adenoparticle insufficiency, right? So can anyone tell me who is this great personality who had this Addison's? Yes. So? Right. So this great personality who had this particular Addison's was... Right. So you can see the hyperpigmented skin. Right? Hyperpigmented skin. <laughs> yes. John F. Kennedy. So John F. Kennedy, right, was the person who had this Addison's, right, who was the former president of the United States of America, right? And this is what is your hypopigmented skin, right, which is nothing but your alabaster skin. I don't know who is she, but I just wanted to show you hypopigmented skin, right? And this is a differential diagnosis for many other conditions as well, all right? Now, we'll move on to the next. Yes, now, the next topic is pheochromocytoma. Addison's is done. Now, your pheochromocytoma is the next topic, right? VMA is elevated in which of the following conditions? Any one of you, please? Right, very good. So that will be your neuroblastoma. So what you have to understand that is the vandal manlic acid levels are not just increased only in patients with pheochromocytoma, also elevated in patients with neuroblastoma, also elevated in patients with the ganglioblastoma, also elevated in patients with ganglioneuroma, so ganglioneuroma and ganglioblastoma, and even in case of excessive anxiety, there will be increased levels of vanilyl vanilic acid levels, okay? Those students who have just joined now, the PDF without annotation is already present on my Telegram channel, that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. And once the session is over, I'll send you the PDF with annotations to the same Telegram channel that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba and as well as Dr. Bhanu Prakash Telegram channel as well. Now, let me discuss in detail about the pheochromocytoma. So, pheochromocytoma, it's a tumor which is originating from neuroendocrine cells, which are also called as the chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla. And what is the predominant hormone that is being produced in these patients? That is the norepinephrine. And followed by that, the epinephrine and as well as the dopamine are being produced. Now, your extra adrenal pheochromocytomas, they are called as the paragangliomas. Right? They are called paragangliomas. Right? And which is also called chemodectomas. And what is the most common site for your paraganglioma? The most common site will be the abdominal paraiotic area. And that particular paraganglioma which is present in the abdominal paraiotic area, that is called as the organ of Zucker candle. Right? Organ of Zucker candle. And what is the most common symptom and as well as sign? The most common symptom will be headache. And what is the reason for the headache? the most common sign will be the hypertension. So the headache that you will have in these individual will be your occipital headache. And that is because of your hypertension, okay? So I'm very sorry for the ads which are coming up in between. Right. Then you take carbohydrate metabolism in pheochromocytoma. There will be increase in the glucose level that is because of increase in the glycogenolysis and as well as anti-insulin action. And the hematocrit levels are elevated and calcium levels are also elevated. Why is that calcium levels elevated? Because pheochromocytoma will produce parathormone-like protein which will increase the calcium levels. And the basal metabolic rate in these individuals will also be increased and because of which there will be weight loss, profuse sweating and elevated body temperature. And what will happen to the postural reflexes that are being lost? Why the postural reflexes are lost? Because of blunting of sympathetic activity. So there will be blunting of sympathetic reflexes. And that is the reason why the postural reflexes are lost. And that will be the clinical features. And what is the first line investigation? First line investigation is 24 hours. 24 hour urinary levels of metabolites of catecholamines, that is VMA levels, are elevated. Then, what is the investigation of choice or confirmatory test? The investigation of choice or confirmatory test will be your plasma metanephrine levels. And this plasma metanephrine levels, they are elevated almost four times. <laughs> Right, they are elevated almost four times, okay? Or it should be like more than four times to confirm it as pheochromocytoma. Then what is the imaging of choice to detect adrenal pheochromocytoma and extra adrenal pheochromocytoma? That will be your dotate PET scan, 
Hmm? That is gallium 68. Dotate PET scan. Okay. Then followed by that, the next important investigation can be your MRI. Then what is the treatment of choice in these patients? The treatment of choice in patients with the pheochromocytoma will be surgical resection has to be done. Right? Then what is the drug of choice? See, before taking the patient to surgery, the blood pressure has to be reduced to less than 160 by 90. So for that reason, you need to give phenoxybenzamine as a drug of choice. Right? For that reason, you need to give phenoxybenzamine as a drug of choice. Okay? So this is about your pheochromocytoma in total. But if there is intraoperative hypertensive peroxisms, then we give the fentolamine. Right? And if there is your intraoperative hypertensive crisis, then we give nitroprusside. Or if it is not available, then we give nitroglycerin. Right? And for extraordinary pheochromocytomas, the treatment that we give is the Averbuck chemotherapy protocol. Hmm? Averbuck chemotherapy protocol is what we need to give in which you have vincristin, dacarbazin, and then cyclophosphamide will be there. Okay. So that is what is your Averbuck chemotherapy protocol. And with Averbuck chemotherapy protocol, if the tumor is not subsiding or if the levels are not subsiding, the residual forms are treated by your MIBG. Okay, this completes the discussion of your pheochromocytoma. All right, now, okay. Next, let us start the discussion on parathyroid-related disorders. So the question is, 45-year-old man with history of the primary hyperparathyroidism comes to your clinic for a follow-up visit. He was diagnosed three years ago after routine blood, uh, blood test revealed an elevation of calcium levels. He has no complaints. Review of the systems is negative. Physical examination is unremarkable. Family history is negative for the similar problems. Calcium is 12.5. DEXA scan shows T-score of minus 2. What is the appropriate treatment regimen that you'll be doing in these patients? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, fusion. The nitroprusside should be given if there is intra, uh, intraoperative hypertensive crisis. Right? If there is intraoperative hypertensive crisis. Okay? Right. So, yes. What is that you need to do in these patients? So please remember, if the calcium levels are elevated more than one compared to the baseline level, then you need to do surgical resection of parathyroid. Normal levels are 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. And in these patients, the calcium level is 12.5. You need to do surgical resection. Okay. Now, let me discuss the topic of the hyperparathyroidism. And what are all the various indications for surgery? The indications for surgery is if the patient is having significant bone kidney, gastrointestinal, or neuromuscular symptoms of primary hyperparathyroidism to surgical resection. Second, elevation of serum calcium level by more than 1 milligram per deciliter the, within the, of the normal range to surgical resection. If the 24-hour urinary calcium level, if it is more than 400 milligrams, do surgical resection. If there is decrease in the creatinine clearance by 30%, do surgical resection. Right, And if there is significant reduction in bone density, where the T-score is like minus, less than minus 2.5, do surgical resection. Okay. Now, coming to the discussion of hyperparathyroidism. So, what is the most common cause of hyperparathyroidism is solitary parathyroid adenoma. Then what are the secondary causes for your hyperparathyroidism? Secondary causes for hyperparathyroidism will be chronic renal failure, then vitamin D deficiency, and then malabsorption syndrome. Secondary causes are nothing but the one which will be causing hypocalcemia. So the clinical features of your hypercalcemia will be these patients, they will have crossing of the calcium through the blood brain barrier, and because of which they will have psychosis. And they will also have renal calicli. And because of renal calicli, these patients will have the pain in the loin area that will be radiating to the groin. So that is nothing but your colicky pain. And they also develop pseudo-hypertension. And the GAT manifestations will be in the form of the constipation. Okay. And these patients may also develop secondary Parkinsonism as well because the calcium depositing within the basal ganglia. Right, this will be the manifestation of hypercalcemia, and bony abnormalities will be in the form of osteoporosis that is due to increased resorption of the bone. And what is the cause of death in patients with hyperparathyroidism? Is because of the systolic arrest. 
And what is the investigations? Investigations will be increase in the calcium levels, decrease in the phosphorus levels, and there will be increase in the alkaline phosphatase levels, right? And in these individuals, you need to do DEXA scan for estimation of the bone mineral density and localization of the tumor is being done by technetium 99M system EB scan. Right, technetium 99M system EB scan. And one more very, very important is the urinary levels of the phosphate and as well as calcium. So urine calcium is also elevated. Urine phosphate is also elevated or urine phosphorus levels are also elevated. Then what is the treatment that you will be giving in patients with your hyperparathyroidism is the treatment of choice will be surgical resection of the tumor. And what will be the first line treatment for hypercalcemia? Because these patients are having hypercalcemia. The first line treatment for hypercalcemia is you need to give IV fluids, that is normal saline, which will dilute the calcium. Then what is the drug of choice for hypercalcemia secondary to your high, primary hyperparathyroidism? You need to give bisphosphonates. And that bisphosphonates that you will be giving is your ebandronate. Okay. So that is about your hyperparathyroidism, right? Then, then, yeah, you take the bony abnormalities. The bony abnormalities that you will have in these individuals is the osteitis fibrosa cystica, right? Where there will be excessive accumulation of the fibrous tissue within the bone. And you have this bony abnormalities, which is nothing but cord fish spine. That is because of the excessive bone resorption. And these individuals, they will have what is called as rugger jersey spine right where you have alternate black and white appearance and you have pinhead sipping that is also because of increased resorption and when you take a dental film there will be loss of lamina dura and what is this lamina dura so this is what is your lamina dura so there will be loss of lamina dura in these individuals and that you can observe within the dental film where there will be loss of lamina dura and when you see the tumor in these patients so they get an important tumor that is called as the epilis tumor that is very important in patients with the hyperparathyroidism, all right? Then, yeah, so this scan is nothing but your technetium 99M system EB scan, which will be useful for the localization of your solitary parathyroid adenoma, okay? So this was about your hyperparathyroidism. And in patients with hyperparathyroidism, please remember, there will be hypercalcemia and the calcium will come and deposit in the ectopic sites. So this is nothing but your ectopic calcification that you will have in patients with the hyperparathyroidism. All right. Next, followed by that, you need to know that there is increased bone resorption. So you will notice the osteolytic lesions. Right, you will notice the osteolytic lesions in these individuals. So this completes the discussion of your hyperparathyroidism. Now we will move on to the hypoparathyroidism. So hypoparathyroidism, what is the important etiology is? What is the condition where you can have acute hypoparathyroidism? Acute hypoparathyroidism you will get in patients with surgical resection of thyroid for the thyroid goiter. Right, surgical resection of the thyroid for thyroid goiter. And Dijuard syndrome, it is another condition where you will have hypoparathyroidism, but this will be your chronic hypoparathyroidism, right? Where you will have, I hope you are aware of this particular mnemonic that is CATCH22. Okay, so cardiac abnormalities, abnormal faces in the form of your cleft lip, thymic hypoplasia, then C stands for your cleft palate, and then hypocalcemia is your H and abnormality is on chromosome number 22. And what will be the clinical features of your hypocalcemia? The clinical features of your hypocalcemia will be perioral and as well as periungual paresthesias. Right? Perioral and periungual paresthesias. And these patients will also develop tetany. Right? And what is the cause of death in these patients? The cause of death in these patients will be laryngospasm is a cause of death. And how do you diagnose these patients? You need to do parathormone levels that will be decreased and calcium levels will be decreased. 
and when you do an ecg ecg will show you that there is long qt interval and that is because of your hypocalcemia and what is the treatment you need to give calcium supplementation or calcium gluconate should be given right calcium gluconate should be given <laughs> then coming to your pseudo hypoparathyroidism pseudo hypoparathyroidism is that where parathormone will be present adequately but parathormone receptors they are being resistant right parathormone receptors are being resistant and why is that due to that is due to gina's gene mutation and because of this gina's gene mutation these patients will develop what is called as gs alpha subunit deficiency and that will result in your pseudo hypoparathyroidism and in patients with pseudo hypoparathyroidism parathormone is present in adequate levels so the treatment in these patients will be calcium supplementation okay because there is hypocalcemia that is the reason why you need to give calcium now this are the very very important images so your troches sign that you see in patients with latent tetany you will have what is called positive troches sign so where you need to apply this particular cuff you increase the cuff pressure to more than 20 mm of mercury of the baseline you will have the development of this particular tetany all right then followed by this tetany the next important is the chostic sign so what is this particular chostic sign chostic sign is that you tap the facial nerve over the angle of mandible you will observe the spasm on that half of the face and that is what is called chostic sign and that is also observed in patients with the latent tetany then you take this particular troches you come across the same terminology in two other places that is your troches lymph node which is also called virtuous lymph node you see that in patients with carcinoma of the stomach which is metastasizing to the your left supraclavicular lymph node then next is the troches syndrome you get this in case of carcinoma of the pancreas and that is nothing but your migratory thrombophlebitis okay so that is about your troches syndrome and in these patients with hypocalcemia you come across the two important bony abnormalities genovalgum and genovarum genovalgum is that where you have knock knees and you can remember that this gum will stick both the knees genovarum is that where you have the presence of the bow legs you keep a rum bottle between the both the knees then you get this particular bow legs then in patients with pseudo hypoparathyroidism okay right in patients with pseudo hypoparathyroidism they develop what is called as albright hereditary osteodystrophy in albright hereditary osteodystrophy there will be short fourth and fifth metacarpal bones right there will be short fourth and fifth metacarpal bones so that is the reason why these patients with pseudo hypoparathyroidism whenever they make a fist what is that you will observe is you will observe a knuckle you will observe a knuckle then this will be dimple and this will be dimple and this is what is called as knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign right this is what is called as knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign now what may be the differential diagnosis the differential diagnosis your down syndrome where your third metacarpal will be short so thereby these patients will develop knuckle dimple knuckle knuckle sign and the another important differential diagnosis will be turner syndrome where your fourth metacarpal will be short and thereby you get what is called knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle syndrome okay so this is about your short metacarpal differential diagnosis okay so with this we are done with the parathyroid disorders then we will move on to the next one that is thyroid disorders so before going on to that can anyone answer this question yes which of the following most closely represent the lower limit of the third generation tsh assay <clears throat> so the one which closely represents the third generation tsh assay is your 0.04 milli units per liter i'll be discussing about the tsh assay subsequently just give me a minute so now you take we have the hyperthyroidism and as well as the hypothyroidism so most common cause of the hyperthyroidism will be graves disease and it's an autoimmune disorder where you have thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins 
as the autoantibodies. Then Hashimoto's, that is the most common cause of the hypothyroidism in India. Whereas, and the antibodies that you have in these individuals, this is also an autoimmune disease. The antibodies will be anti-TPO antibodies, right? And these are IgG antibodies. The presence of your IgG antibodies tells you only the diagnosis, but they don't tell you about the CVRT of the disease, okay? Then, what is the most common cause for your hypothyroidism globally? Most common cause for hypothyroidism globally will be your iodine deficiency, all right? Now, you take the clinical features. So, the clinical features, if you take, differentiate between hyper and hypothyroidism, these patients will have the heat intolerance, whereas in Hashimoto's, they will have cold intolerance. These patients, they will have weight loss and as well as increased appetite, whereas these patients, they will have hypothyroidism, they will have weight gain and there will be decreased appetite. And in patients with your hyperthyroidism, there will be increase in the glucose levels and increase in the free fatty acids and there will be proteolysis causing proximal myopathy. Whereas in hypothyroidism, there will be hepatic gluconeogenesis does not occur, thereby in myxodema coma, only in myxodema coma, there will be decrease in glucose levels and there will be dyslipidemia. Why? Because your lipolysis does not occur. And what will happen to the protein metabolism does not occur. So thereby, these patients, they will have muscle fatigue. And you take the cardiovascular manifestation, these patients will develop systemic hypertension or systolic hypertension. There will be increase in heart rate and they will have arrhythmia. Most common arrhythmia will be atrial fibrillation due to which they will have irregularly irregular pulse. Then you take in case of Hashimoto's. In Hashimoto's, they will have diastolic hypertension. And they will have bradycardia, right? They will have bradycardia. Just a minute, please. Right. I'm very sorry. <clears throat> right. So, now, then the next important is, okay, so ads are coming up. Just one minute. Yeah. So, Right. The next important is you take the neurological manifestations. The neurological manifestations in patients with hyperthyroidism, there will be increase in the deep tendon reflexes. And they will also have the fine tremors in the, when there is outstretched hand. Whereas in Hashimoto's, there will be delayed relaxation of deep tendon reflexes. And that we call it as the hung up reflex. Right. And the next important is in patients with your graves, they will have decreased sleep because of excessive firing of the neurons. These patients, they will have anxiety. They will have extreme nervousness in case of graves. Whereas in Hashimoto's, they will have increased sleep, excessive sleep. And if you disturb them, so they will sleep almost 16 to 18 hours per day. That is what you see in case of the Hashimoto's. Okay. Then what is your jot based dose phenomena? jot based dose phenomena is... This is iodine-induced hyperthyroidism, right? Iodine-induced hyperthyroidism is nothing but your jot-based dose, okay? Whereas iodine-induced hypothyroidism will be your Ulf-Chaikov effect. 
right and that is due to inhibition of organification right that is because of inhibition of the organification okay so this is about the difference between your jot based dose and as well as the wolf tchaikov effect all right then now let me take up the investigations so you need to know a very important investigation that is thyroid profile always whenever the question related to your thyroid is asked the first line investigation will be your tsh then you need to do the free t4 levels that will be the first line investigation all right then you take in patients with the primary right you take in patients with the primary hypothyroidism in primary hypothyroidism your t3 t4 levels will be reduced and tsh will be increased okay whereas you take in case of primary hyperthyroidism in primary hyper t3 t4 levels will be elevated and the tsh level will be reduced all right then you take in case of the secondary hypothyroidism in secondary hypothyroidism everything will be reduced t3 t4 tsh everything will be reduced whereas in secondary hyperthyroidism everything will be increased t3 t4 tsh everything will be increased then you need to do radioactive iodine uptake studies so radioactive iodine uptake studies it is being done with the help of the iodine 132 or iodine 123 the condition where there is high radioactive iodine uptake is that is graves disease where there is increased radioactive iodine uptake and the conditions where there is decreased radioactive iodine uptake that will be in case of your decurvains thyroiditis right decurvains thyroiditis which is nothing but the one which occurs secondary to viral infection of the upper respiratory tract then what will be the treatment in case of the graves the drug of choice will be your thyroid peroxidase inhibitor that is methimazole should be given right methimazole should be given but in case of the first trimester of pregnancy we don't give methimazole because of teratogenicity associated with that that is aplasia cutis that is the reason why we give propyl thiouracil in the first trimester of pregnancy with hyperthyroidism whereas in second and as well as the third trimester the drug that we give is methimazole hmm? the drug that we give is methimazole in second and as well as third trimester all right then so that was about the treatment of hyperthyroidism we also give the propranolol right propranolol that is mainly to reduce the heart rate to reduce the anxiety to reduce the tremors to reduce the uh, yeah so that will be the advantage of your propranolol then the other treatment option in case of your graves will be iodine 131 the adverse effect associated with iodine 131 is it can cause permanent hypothyroidism right and those pregnancy don't give iodine 131 and at the same time iodine 131 can be given in those individuals who are having hyperthyroidism non pregnant individual non lactating mother right so in that scenario only you can give iodine 131 and again graves of thermopathy don't give iodine 131 okay right then coming to your hypothyroidism in hypothyroidism the treatment that you need to give is levothyroxin okay levothyroxin is nothing but your t4 and the dosage is 1.6 microgram per kg per minute and in individuals with cardiac disorder you need to start with low dose and non cardiac disorder you can give full dose and you have to give this levothyroxin early morning fasting state okay so this is about right so this is about the treatment of your hyper and as well as the hypothyroidism okay now please answer this question endocrine disorder with the following presentation acromegaly cushing syndrome addison's hypothyroidism any one of you please so what is the endocrine ab abnormality that you are observing here the endocrine abnormality that you are observing here is the pericardial effusion right so you can see that the cardiac border like it is increased and you can see the pedicle you have the narrow pedicle right and this is your classical money bag appearance or water bottle appearance and you see that in patients with the hypothyroidism in hypothyroidism cardiac manifestations will be bradycardia pericardial effusion and they also develop first degree av block and because they develop first degree av block the pr interval will be prolonged okay so this completes the discussion of your thyroid related disorders all right next question next topic 
that is your men syndrome that is multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes so the another name for your men one the another name for men one it is also called as wormers so please remember you should not get confused with this term called wormers wormers where you have n that is progeria premature aging whereas in wormers in men one it is wormers m will be there in wormers progeria n will be there so please remember without any confusion and men two a another name is sipple syndrome right and men two b it is also called as wagenman froboise syndrome right wagenman froboise syndrome and you don't have another name for your men four and what is the chromosomal abnormality in men one so the gene which is being defective first is men one gene which is present on chromosome 11 in men 2a and men 2b the gene mutated is ret proto oncogene and the chromosome abnormality is on chromosome number 10 and men 4 the gene which is which is being mutated is cdk n1b right and the chromosome abnormality is on chromosome number 12 right and if you see the tumors now in case of your men 1 you have three p's what are these three p's that will be your pituitary, parathyroid tumors, and as well as the pancreatic tumors, right? But which is most common among these three? Parathyroid adenoma, that will be the most common, right? And among the pancreatic tumors, so you have non-functional and as well as the functional. So in case of non-functional pancreatic tumor, that will be P-POMA, right? P-POMA will be most common, non-functional. Right, and whereas your functional glucagonoma will be more common, right? Glucagonoma will be more common, and extra endocrine manifestations. If you see in these patients, the extra endocrine manifestations will be in the form of the foregut carcinoid that you will have in patients with your men one, and they also have the angiofibroma, right? And you also have that in patients with the collagenoma. Okay, so that is what you have in case of men one. Whereas you take in case of the men two a, men two a, the tumors will be pat. What is this pat? Okay, so you can just remember this mnemonic tap. What is this tap? Tap stands for thyroid abnormality. That is medullary carcinoma of thyroid where there is excessive calcitonin production. A stands for adrenal pheochromocytoma, where there is excessive catecholamine production. And P stands for parathyroid tumor, that is solitary parathyroid adenoma. All right. Then you take in men 2 b In men 2 b you only have just T and A. Ta. P is not there. So parathyroid tumors will not be there in case of your men 2 b which is also called men 3. And extra endocrine manifestations, if you see, in case of men 2 a you have the amyloidosis, where there is excessive accumulation of abnormal protein. And they also developed the Hirschsprung's disease, where there is absence of ganglion within the GAD. Okay. And thereby the child will present with constipation. Whereas you take in case of men 2B, which is also called men 3, these patients they develop neuromas. Right? They develop neuromas, gastrointestinal and mucosal neuromas. And these patients will also develop morphanoid habitus. Right, morphanoid habitus. Okay, then coming to men four in the last men four, they have two P's. What are these two P's? Pituitary and parathyroid will be there. Pituitary and parathyroid. Sexual organ tumors in males, they will have testicular tumors, right? Whereas in females, they develop cervical tumors. I'm sorry, one second, right? In males. Testicular tumor, whereas in females, they will develop cervical tumors. And along with this, these patients will also develop adrenal plus renal tumors. Okay, so this will be about your men syndromes, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes. And I'll show you an image, please answer this. In which condition do you see this? Men 1, men 2A, men 2B, men 4. Anyone? Yeah, schwannomas. Yes. Right. So this is nothing but your neuromas. Hmm? These are nothing but your neuromas. Okay. So you see that in case of men to be. Right. Men to be, you have this particular neuromas. All right. So this completes the discussion of your men syndromes. Then we'll move on to the discussion of diabetes mellitus. Now, this is the recent INICT question, November 2023. So, can anyone answer this? 
child brought to the emergency department with an unconscious state, vomiting and as well as abdominal pain, heart rate 100 per minute, blood pressure 100 by 60, workup showed pH of 7.2, blood glucose 300 milligrams per deciliter, ketone 3 plus. What should be the best management in this patient? Anyone? Right. So, yeah, see, diagnosis is definitely diabetic ketoacidosis. There is no doubt in that. But in case of di diabetic ketoacidosis, what is that you need to give first? You need to give IV fluids first. That is normal saline. Followed by that, we give insulin. And the insulin is given in the form of insulin infusion. So, insulin infusion, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 unit uh, per kg per hour dose insulin after one hour of the IV fluids. That is what is the treatment in case of DKA. So in DKA, we don't give subcutaneous insulin. We don't give subcutaneous insulin. And we don't give insulin first and then IV fluids later. No, IV fluids first, then insulin infusion next. Okay. So the answer in this question is A. Now, let me discuss about the diabetes mellitus. So this is the last topic in the endocrinology. So the pathogenesis in patients with the type 1 diabetes mellitus is it is autoimmune. So autoimmune antibodies will be anti-GAD antibodies and then followed by that, the islet cell antibodies. And type 2, it is the insulin resistance. Right? And this particular insulin resistance that is due to release of the chemical called resistin. Right. Now, in case of your type 1 diabetes mellitus, the insulin level will be reduced. Whereas in case of your type 2 diabetes mellitus, the insulin level will be increased because of insulin resistance, the glucose is not reduced. So the insulin keeps on producing. And age, if you see, less than 20 years is type 1 diabetes mellitus. BMI will be absolutely normal. And type 2 diabetes mellitus, the age will be more than 30 years. And the BMI will be increased. They are obese individual. And HLA association will be there in type 1 diabetes mellitus. That is the HLA, dr 3 and as well as DR4. Whereas in type 2 diabetes mellitus, there is no HLA association. And in type 1 diabetes mellitus, you will have clinical features as polyuria, polydipsia, and as well as polyphagia. But in type 2 diabetes mellitus, these manifestations are rare. And these patients, they usually have fatigue. Right? They usually have fatigue. And they are more prone for infections, increased infections. And there will be poor wound healing. Right? Poor wound healing. And complications, if you see, the most common acute complication in type 1 will be your diabetic ketoacidosis. So diabetic ketoacidosis is more common in type 1 rather than type 2. And in diabetic ketoacidosis, the ketone body will be positive. The pH will be acidic pH. And acidosis will be there where the pH will be less than 7.36. And glucose levels will be more than 250 milligrams per deciliter. And in type 2 diabetes mellitus, the acute complication will be hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. This is more common in type 2 rather than type 1. Right? More common in type 2 rather than type 1. Then microvascular complications will be there in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. And that will be your diabetic retinopathy. Right? And diabetic neuropathy. Okay? And diabetic nephropathy. Okay, so this will be there in both type 1 and type 2. And macrovascular complication will be in the form of coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular accidents, and peripheral arterial disease. So this will be the complications that you come across in patients with the diabetes mellitus. Then you take the diagnosis in these individuals. Diagnosis, the normal level of your FBS will be less than 100. Normal PPBS will be less than 140. HbA1c normal will be less than 5.6. And impaired value will be 101 to 125 fasting. PPBS 141 to 199. And impaired value of your HbA1c will be 5.7 to 6.4. And you take the diabetic range. The fasting will be more than or equal to 126. PPBS will be more than or equal to 200. And HbA1c will be more than 6.5. Then what will be the target value? Target value means in already known diabetic patients, 
how much should be the target FBS whenever you are treating yeast? It should be less than 130. And PPBS, it should be less than 180. And HbA1c, it should be less than 7. And what is a gold standard investigation for diagnosing diabetes mellitus? That is OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test. All right. Then coming to the causes of early morning hyperglycemia in patients who are on the insulin therapy. One is your fasting hyperglycemia. So fasting hyperglycemia, kis wajay se ho sakta hai? why does it occur? That is because of decrease in the insulin supplementation. Right? That is because of, see, what happened is, what happens here is, the patient is advised to take 20 units. Magar, galti se patient ne 10 unit liya hai. Patient has taken only 10 units instead of 20 units. So, these patients will have increase in the 3 a.m. blood glucose level and increase in the 6 a.m. blood glucose level because the insulin what he has taken is less. So, the treatment what you need to do is you need to increase the insulin dose. Then coming to the Don's phenomena. What is the mechanism of the Don's phenomena? That is because of the early morning growth hormone surge. Right? That is because of early morning growth hormone surge. Okay? And not only that, that is because of early morning steroid surge. So, isliye, in Don's phenomena, 3 a.m. blood glucose levels will be normal, but 6 a.m. blood glucose level will be increased. And in the treatment, you need to avoid, right? You need to avoid late night carbohydrate diet. Late night carbohydrate diet should not be taken. And coming to your somogi, somogi is because of increase in the dosage of the insulin. So patient is to take actually only 10, but instead of 10, by mistake, the patient has taken 20 units in the night. So thereby 3 a.m. blood glucose level, you will have hypoglycemia because as because of insulin, excessive insulin, and 6 a.m. blood glucose level will be high. And what is the treatment that you need to do? Decrease the insulin dose. All right? Decrease the insulin dose. Okay? So, this is about your causes of early morning hyperglycemia. Then coming to the treatment in case of diabetes mellitus, in type 1 diabetes mellitus, the treatment of choice will be the insulin. Right? You have short-acting insulins and you have long-acting insulins. And in type 2 diabetes mellitus, the drug of choice will be your metformin. Why the drug of choice is metformin is because metformin will cause maximum reduction in the HbA1c. Right? It can cause maximum reduction in the HbA1c. That is the reason why metformin is considered as it will reduce the HbA1c by almost 2%. That is the reason why in type 2 diabetes mellitus, metformin is considered as the drug of choice. We have actually n number of drugs. Metformin is considered as the drug of choice. Okay. Then coming to two important additional forms, that is Modi and as well as LADA. In case of Modi, maturity onset diabetes of young, what is the problem is that is beta cell dysfunction. It is not beta cell destruction. It is beta cell dysfunction where there is decreased insulin production. It is not beta cell destruction, beta cell dysfunction. And inheritance, okay, inheritance, if you see, these patients, they should have very strong genetical inheritance, right? Minimum two generations should be diabetic, right? Minimum two generations should be diabetic to call it as Modi. And in these individuals, the BMI will be absolutely normal and they never develop DKA, right? These patients will never develop DKA. That is the... Right, that is an important point related to your Modi. And the age of these patients with Modi will be around 20 to 30 years. Right, and this particular Modi, we have many types out of which Modi 1 to 6 are usually seen. Out of this Modi 1 to 6 also, Modi 3 is the most common type. And in this Modi 3, which is the most common type, the gene that is being mutated is the HNF1 alpha is the gene that is being mutated. And the treatment that you need to give in these individuals is low dose sulfonyl urea should be given. That is about your Modi, maturity onset diabetes of young, right? Then next is LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adults. So this is seen in case of the elderly individuals. This is also called type 1.5 diabetes mellitus. And this is the rarest form of diabetes mellitus. And the pathogenesis in case of your LADA will be antibodies. That antibodies will be anti-GAD antibodies and islet cell antibodies which have been produced in adults. 
that is why it is called type 1.5 diabetes mellitus so that will be the antibodies and these antibodies what they do they destroy the beta cells and seen in the elderly individual because the beta cells are destroyed the insulin levels will be reduced so the treatment that you need to give in these patients is you need to give insulin okay so that is about your diabetes mellitus now image based questions related to your diabetes mellitus so can anyone identify what is this particular instrument Yes, the side effect of metformin will be lactic acidosis. Yeah, so this particular instrument is the semi Weinstein monofilament test. Right, semi Weinstein monofilament test. And what is its use? Mainly for assessment of diabetic neuropathy. And the question can be asked, what is the most common form of diabetic neuropathy? The most common form of diabetic neuropathy will be distal symmetrical sensory neuropathy. Right, distal symmetrical sensory neuropathy, that is the most common form of neuropathy. Then followed by that, you get motor neuropathy, you get mononeuropathy, you get mononeuritis multiplex. And the most common cranial nerve that will be affected is third cranial nerve and even though the third cranial nerve is affected there, there will be midriasis will not be there these patients will have pupillary sparing sensory neuropathy will be there and the first sensation that will be lost is the vibration sense is being lost and we test this particular vibration sense with the help of the tuning fork okay and there will be also autonomic neuropathy as well because of which these patients will develop postural hypotension then yes what is this particular sign in, in which clinical condition you see this so this is what is nothing but your prayer sign, right? And you see this in patients with the diabetes mellitus. And this we also call it as diabetic chiropathy. So diabetic chiropathy is that where there is limited joint mobility, right? Where there is limited joint mobility. That is what is called diabetic chiropathy. And once you control the blood glucose level, they will be able to approximate both the hands, right? That is called diabetic chiropathy or prayer sign. Then, in which endocrine disorder do you see this? So, what exactly is the problem here? The problem here is xanthelasma. Right? Xanthelasma. So, where you have, you will see this in conditions wherever there is dyslipidemia. Right? Wherever there is dyslipidemia, you have this xanthelasma. And you come across this in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. And you come across this in patients with the hypothyroidism as well. Okay? Then, now, where do you see this condition and what is this? This is what is nothing but your neuropathic ulcer. Right? <clears throat> because the edges are clean. And you are seeing that over the sole of the foot. And what is the treatment that you need to do is, you, need, you should not do antibiotic dressing. The treatment that you need to give is the offloading. Right? Offloading. And if at all, if you want to give antibiotics, you need to give IV antibiotics should be given. And the dressing that should be done in these individuals is just betadine dressing should be given. Antibiotic dressing is not required. Okay. So that is about your neuropathic ulcer. Then one more important dermatological manifestation in case of diabetes mellitus again. This is nothing but your necrobiosis. Lipoidica diabeticorum. Okay, so this is what is nothing but your necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum, commonly seen in the lower limbs, commonly observed in females rather than males. Right? Then these patients with necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum. As the time progresses, they will have central clearing as well. Okay. They will also have central clearing. Okay. So this is about your the topics related to endocrinology. Right. So just give me a quick feedback. Like how was the endocrinology revision? So is it fine? Am I going with adequate speed? Or do you want me to step up the speed? Decrease the speed? Is everything fine? Okay, right.
लिटिल बिट डिक्रीज है ठीक है मैं करता हूँ मैं करता हूँ आई ट्राई टू डिक्रीज द स्पीड बिकॉज आई नीड टू कम्प्लीट लॉट ऑफ पोर्शन ना सो इसलिए थोड़ा ज्यादा फास्ट जा रहे ठीक है राइट नाउ एज ऑलरेडी हैव सेड यू दो स्टूडेंट्स हुए जस्ट ज्वाइन नाउ I have sent you the PDF without annotations on my Telegram channel. That is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Guba, right? And immediately after the session with annotations, I'll be sending you the same PDF with annotations on my Telegram channel. That is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Guba, and also I'll be sending on Dr. Bhanu Prakash Telegram channel as well. All right. Now coming to the first topic, that is acute kidney injury. Any one of you? Anuria is defined as the urine output less than. Yes. Right. So, anuria is defined as the urine output less than four mL per hour, or it is less than hundred mL per twenty-four hours. Whereas oliguria. is the scenario where you have the urine output less than 400 ml per 24 hours right less than 400 ml per 24 hours okay so now first let me tell you the definition so the definition of acute kidney injury is that there should be increase in serum creatinine so increase in serum creatinine should be more than 0.3 mg per deciliter within 48 hours okay or there should be increase in serum creatinine more than or equal to 1.5 times the normal value within one week right then urine output even the urine output also should be reduced that is very important and how much should be the decrease in urine output the decrease in urine output should be less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than 6 hours right for more than 6 hours okay then you take the clinical manifestations you will have clinical manifestations because of increase in urea and as well as creatinine so urea will go and accumulate within the brain causing uremic encephalopathy and because of uremic encephalopathy these patients can have the altered sensorium and as well as the seizures and they can accumulation of the urea within the pericardium and that will result in the uremic pericarditis where these patients will present with chest pain and urea can also accumulate within the gat causing uremic gastroparesis right uremic gastroparesis where the gastrointestinal motility can be reduced they can present with either constipation or uh, alternatingly there can be diarrhea as well okay and urea will also accumulate within the diaphragm resulting in the form of the hiccups and urea will also accumulate within the skin causing the skin frost and because of which there will be profuse itching and urine output will be reduced and fluid will be accumulated in the body and because of which these patients will develop hypertension and the fluid will go and accumulate in all the serous cavities like pericardial effusion right and they also develop the pleural effusion right and they also develop the ascites and they also develop the periorbital edema okay and not only that they will also have the pedal edema so the fluid gets accumulated in all these serous cavities causing these particular abnormality so can anyone tell me what is this particular sign which i have shown you yes so this is what is nothing but your astrexis right astrexis which is nothing but your flapping tremors now what will be the differential diagnosis for this particular flapping tremors will be is the differential diagnosis for the flapping tremors will be number 1 hepatic encephalopathy right then uremic encephalopathy then carbon dioxide narcosis these are all the differential diagnosis for your flapping tremors and how do we classify the etiology of the acute renal failure we classify the etiology of acute renal failure as pre renal where the there is decreased renal perfusion due to any cause intra renal where the pathology is within the kidney Post renal, where the pathology is outside the kidney, 
right? So in case of pre-renal, that could be because of the decrease in the cardiac output. It can happen in patients with a congestive heart failure. It can also happen in patients with cirrhosis of liver where there will be renal artery vasoconstriction. And it can also happen in case of diarrhea and as well as vomiting. Intrinsic renal is that where the pathology is within the kidney, mainly you have toxins. And this particular toxins, very important that you need to remember is the contrast-induced nephropathy. And we have many antibiotics. And what are these antibiotics? That will be the amphotericin B, which is an antifungal drug. Then aminoglycosides. Then cephaloridin. Right? Then the antineoplastic drug that is cisplatin. So these are some of the exogenous toxins. Then endogenous toxins will be your hemolytic anemias, like where hemoglobinuria. Then rhabdomyolysis that is myoglobinuria, right? Then tumor lysis syndrome, where the individual is being given a chemotherapy and that chemotherapy will drug cause uh, tumor lysis syndrome, where the tumor material is released into the circulation, passing through the kidney, causing acute tubular necrosis. That is what is nothing but your tumor lysis syndrome. Next, multiple myeloma, where there will be abnormal light chain production, right? Where there will be abnormal light chains that gets accumulated within the kidney, causing acute uh, tubular necrosis causing intrinsic type of uh, uh, acute renal failure. Then post renal will be pathologies outside the kidney. And the most common cause in males will be benign prostatic hyperplasia. Then we have many other causes that is ureteric calculi, bladder calculi, then bladder malignancy. These are all the post renal causes. But most common cause in males will be your benign prostatic hyperplasia, in which you need to do transurethral resection of the prostate. Then we also have bilateral ureteric fibrosis, which can cause post-renal. Bilateral ureteric fibrosis, you see that in patients with scleroderma. And we also have a drug, and that particular drug will be methysergide. Right? Methysergide. So these two conditions, you will have bilateral ureteric fibrosis. Bilateral ureteric fibrosis can cause your post-renal type of acute renal failure. Yeah, even your schistosoma. Schistosoma hematobium is associated with the carcinoma of urinary bladder and that can cause post renal type of acute renal failure. Then coming to the differentiation between the pre-renal and as well as the intrinsic renal. So very important parameter that will differentiate is the FENA, uh, the fraction excretion of sodium. In pre-renal, it is less than one and in intrinsic renal, it is more than one. Renal failure index, <laughs> pre-renal less than one. Intrinsic renal, more than one. And you take the urinary sodium. In case of pre-renal, it is more than 10 milli equivalents, whereas intrinsic renal, it is less than 10 milli equivalents. Blood urea nitrogen to the serum creatinine will be more than 20 in pre-renal, and it is around 10 to 15 in case of intrinsic renal. And urine-specific gravity in patients with the pre-renal, it will be increased, okay? So it will be more than 1.020. Whereas in case of the intrinsic renal, compared to pre-renal, the, the urine specific gravity will be less. And how much will be that? That is less than 1.012. That is in case of the intrinsic renal. Then how will you work up the overall? What are the electrolyte abnormalities? See, the serum creatinine levels will be increased in patients with acute kidney injury. And particularly in patients with contrast-induced nephropathy, if you observe, the serum creatinine, it keeps on rising. So within 24 to 48 hours, it raises. And three to five days, it will reach the peak value. And within five to seven days, the creatinine will return back to normal in contrast-induced nephropathy. And there are certain electrolytes which are increased in patients with acute renal failure. There will be hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypermagnesemia. There will be increase in the uric acid levels. And what are the electrolytes that will be decreased in these patients is there will be hyponatremia, right? And these patients will also have the hypocalcemia. And why hyponatremia? That is because of your dilution effect. And coming to your ABG, ABG will show you that there is metabolic acidosis. Now, why there is metabolic acidosis is that is because of decreased ammonia excretion. So when ammonia is not excreted, the H plus ion, which has to be attached to the ammonia, does not get attached. So ammonium is not excreted out and that will result in the acidosis. So metabolic acidosis will be there. And one more reason for metabolic acidosis is because of inhibition of bicarbonate reabsorption at the level of proximal convoluted tubule. 
Okay, then what does the ECG show? You are having hyperkalemia. So you'll have tall tinted T waves. Okay, and complete blood picture will show you anemia, but anemia will not be there in all the cases of acute renal failure. Only in case of hemolytic anemia is causing acute kidney injury, you will have anemia, right? And whereas in chronic renal failure, all the cases you will have anemia. And next is you also have eosinophilia or the eosinophilia. So in which conditions you will have eosinophilia is if suppose if it is thromboembolic disease, right? If it is thromboembolic disease causing acute kidney injury, there you will have the eosinophilia or the eosinophilia will be there. And you have some novel biomarkers of acute kidney injury. Novel biomarkers of acute kidney injury is kidney injury molecule one, neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalcin. This we call it as NGAL. And then interleukin-18, then L-type fatty acid binding protein. These are the novel biomarkers of the acute kidney injury, all right? Then you take the treatment. So in case of the rhabdomyolysis, what is the treatment of choice that you need to do is forced alkaline diuresis. That will be, so you need to treat the underlying cause. Right, you need to treat the underlying cause, forced alkaline diuresis. Whereas in case of the tumor lysis syndrome, there is increase in the uric acid levels. So for which you need to give allopurinol, which will decrease the uric acid synthesis, or you need to give rasburicase. This particular rasburicase will cause the excretion of the uric acid. It's a uricosuric agent. And in case of contrast-induced nephropathy, you need to give IV fluids, but the drug of choice is the n cysteine. And if there is symptomatic hyponatremia, you need to give 3% sodium chloride. If there is no symptomatic hyponatremia, we don't give hyponate. 3% sodium chloride. And there is volume overload in these patients. That is the reason why you should give diuretics. And diuretics you should not give in case of pre-renal because in pre-renal already renal perfusion is reduced. So that is the reason why in pre-renal diuretics should be given by monitoring the patient. And hyperkalemia is there in these patients. So drug of choice will be calcium gluconate. But calcium gluconate will not reduce the calcium levels. It will only sensitize the myocardial membrane and prevent the development of arrhythmias. And how can you reduce your uh, potassium? You need to give insulin plus dextrose. You need to give insulin plus dextrose. Then salbutamol nebulization should be given. Then you have the potassium binding agents that is sodium polystyrene sulfonate, sodium zirconate, and then, yeah, so these are the potassium binders. Then hyperphosphatemia. How will you treat these patients with hyperphosphatemia is you need to give sevalimer hydrochloride or you need to give the aluminium hydroxide which will reduce the phosphate levels. And for hypocalcemia, you need to give calcium gluconate. And for hypermagnesemia, magnesium containing antacids should be avoided. Okay, magnesium containing antacids should be avoided like magnesium hydroxide or magnesium carbonate. And for hypertension in patients with acute kidney injury, you need to give levitalol. For acidosis, mainly if the pH is less than 7, then you need to give intravenous sodium bicarbonate should be given. Okay, so this is what is the treatment that you need to give in patients with the acute kidney injury. Okay, now, so you see this question. A 49-year old female attends to your clinic suffering from chronic renal failure due to progressive glomerular disease. She appears well and her blood pressure is 141 by 92 millimeters of mercury. Blood tests reveal elevated phosphate, serum creatinine, urea is elevated. The calcium levels are low. Estimated GFR is 35. And uh, yeah, you would also notice the patient cholesterol levels are moderately raised. The most appropriate management in this patient is Yes, what is the most appropriate management in these patients? Any one of you? So, yeah, very good, Mohammed Hassan. So, you need to give sevalimer hydrochloride. So in patients with chronic renal failure with hyperphosphatemia, what should be your first target is to decrease the phosphate levels, not to give the calcium, right? Not to give the vitamin D. No, we need to decrease the phosphate levels. Why? What is the reason? The reason is because 
this particular calcium, whatever you are giving, it can combine with phosphate. Right? It can combine with phosphate. And that will result in the calcium phosphate formation. So that is the reason why your calcium level again reduces. So first, try to reduce the phosphate. So how can you reduce the phosphate? You can reduce the phosphate by 7-MR hydrochloride. Then followed by that, you give your oral vitamin D or your sinacalcite or calcium mimetic agent can be given. But always reduce the phosphate first, not the calcium to increase. So the answer is A. Now, let us decrease, let us discuss the chronic kidney disease. So chronic kidney, so we are done with the acute renal failure, right? So, right. So please follow the PDF. Don't be in a hurry to write. I will be sending you this PDF with annotations on my Telegram channel. That is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Guba. So don't be in a hurry to write the notes because I'm slightly going a little fast because I need to uh, complete many topics. So you just listen to the session. With annotations, I'll, again, you'll be getting this. Okay. Now, coming to chronic renal failure. So if you take this chronic renal failure, chronic renal failure is being defined based on the decrease in the GFR and as well as the proteinuria. And how much should be the decrease in GFR? Less than 60 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. And proteinuria also will be there. So this decrease in GFR and as well as proteinuria should be there for more than or equal to three months to call it as the chronic renal failure. Okay. Now, depending upon the decrease in the GFR, depending upon decrease in the GFR, we classify this into grade 1, 2, 3A, 3B, 4 and 5. You take in case of the grade 1, the GFR will be more than 90. So here you have the kidney damage, but the GFR is being maintained. How much is the normal GFR? Normal GFR is 90 to 120 ml per minute per ml per kg per 1.73 meter square. Then you take the mild decrease. Grade, I mean, grade 2 will be your mild decrease. And how much will be that? 60 to 89 ml per kg per 1.73 meter square. And in 3, you have 3A and 3B. So that will be 45 to 59 will be your 3A. Then 30 to 44 will be your 3B. And severe decrease, when will you call? If the GFR, if it is in between 15 to 29, and if it is less than 15, we call it as the end-stage renal failure. Right? We call it as the end-stage renal failure. Okay? Then, you take the proteinuria. Right? Proteinuria, we classify that as A1, A2, and as well as A3. So, in A1, the proteinuria will be less than 30. Whereas in A2, the proteinuria will be around 30 to 300 milligrams per grams. Right? Whereas in A3, the proteinuria will be more than 300 milligrams per grams. Okay? So this is about your the definition of chronic renal failure based on your GFR and as well as the proteinuria. Right? Then, coming to the clinical features, you will have the clinical features of the fluid overload that you have in acute kidney injury. That is your periorbital edema, hypertension, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, ascites, and pedal edema. And you also have the features of uremia that you have that we have discussed in case of the acute renal failure. That is uremic encephalopathy, uremic pericarditis, uremic gastroparesis, uremic frost, and the, uh, the urea will accumulate in the diaphragm causing hiccups. But the additional manifestations in patients with a chronic renal failure will be renal osteodystrophy. And that renal osteodystrophy is mainly because of increase in parathormone secondary to your hypocalcemia. Anemia will be there. That is because of decrease in erythropoietin production. And because of your uh, renal osteodystrophy and anemia, these patients will have growth retardation. And there will be dyslipidemia. That is because of decreased lipoprotein lipase activity. Right? Because of decreased lipoprotein lipase activity, these patients will develop dyslipidemia. And they will have hypoglycemia because of increase in the insulin levels. Why? Because the kidney is the place through which the insulin has to be excreted out. If the kidney is damaged, the insulin is not excreted out. The insulin levels increases and that will result in hypoglycemia. And urea will accumulate in the peripheral nerves causing peripheral neuropathy. And these patients with chronic renal failure, they are more prone for infections that is because of granulocytopenia. 
right? So because of granulocytopenia, these individuals, they are more prone for infections. And not only that, this urea will also accumulate within the cornea, right? So this will result in what is called as band keratopathy, where there will be opacification of the cornea, right? And what did I tell you? There will be like bone resorption and that will result in what is called renal osteodystrophy and that is because of your hyperparathyroidism. And if you take the platelets in these individuals, there will be also decrease in the platelet levels. There will be thrombocytopenia, right? And because of which they have excoriations. And there will be also ecchymosis. That is because of decrease in the platelet levels. Okay. And urea accumulates within the skin, causing uremic frost, where there will be dryness of the skin that will cause itching. And this is what is nothing but your pedal edema that is because of the fluid accumulation. And in these patients with chronic renal failure, they have this characteristic half and half nail. Right? Half and half nail. And this we call it as the Lindsay's nail. Right? And why is this? That is because of increase in the capillary density where the proximal half of the nail will be pale and the distal half of the nail will be dark. This is what is called as the half and half nail, okay, which is also called Lindsay's nail, all right? Now, after having discussed about this, you need to know how to differentiate acute and as well as chronic kidney injury. So history of renal failure, it is, present, it is absent in case of acute kidney injury, but present in case of chronic renal failure. Anemia, it will be present only in case of the hemolytic anemia causing acute kidney injury. Whereas in case of chronic kidney disease, the anemia will be definitely present because of decrease in the erythropoietin levels. And you take the elevated phosphorus and as well as the parathormone levels. Parathormone levels are elevated in case of chronic, but parathormone levels will be normal in case of acute. Then you take neuropathy, present in case of chronic, absent in case of the acute. Band keratopathy, present in chronic, absent in acute. Then renal bone disease, present in acute, absent in case of chronic. Small kidneys, present in case of chronic, absent in case of acute. And what are the exceptions where you have large kidneys in case of chronic? That is in case of polycystic kidney disease, diabetes mellitus, multiple myeloma, leukemia causing acute uh, chronic renal failure, then amyloidosis causing chronic renal failure. So in these conditions of chronic renal failure, you'll have enlarged kidneys. Tolerance to azotemia, it is absent in case of acute, whereas present in case of chronic renal failure. So these are the differences between acute and as well as the chronic, right? Then followed by that, the treatment. Okay, so the treatment in case of the chronic what is that you will be giving is, what is the most common cause of chronic? First of all, the most common cause of the chronic renal failure will be diabetes mellitus. So because the most common cause of your chronic will be diabetes mellitus, you need to give insulin as the drug of choice. And you have to ensure that the HbA1c levels should be less than 7 by giving insulin. That is very, very important. All right. Then you also need to give erythropoietin supplementation and that erythropoietin should be given subcutaneously twice weekly. And that erythropoietin supplementation that you need to give is the epoietin alpha and then tarbipoietin alpha. So these two are your erythropoietin supplementations. Then you also need to give vitamin D supplementation because these patients will have the hypocalcemia. So this is about your treatment. Now, in patients with end-stage renal disease, they will be requiring the renal replacement therapy that is done in the form of your hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis or renal transplantation should be done. Renal transplantation should be done. Now, whenever you are doing the hemodialysis, you need to create a fistula. And the name of this fistula is Seminobrisia fistula. And this is given in the honor of the name of the Italian doctor that is Seminobrisia. So you need to create a fistula. And what is the most common complication of your um, hemodialysis is they develop hypotension, right? And across this filtration membrane, your amyloid beta 2 will not be accumulated and that will be increased. And that will accumulate within the median nerve, resulting in the carpal tunnel syndrome. And they also accumulate within the brain, 
causing dementia that is called as the dialysis dementia and there will be loss of your b5 during dialysis because b5 is very small it is lost that is pantothenic acid and that will result in what is called as the burning feet syndrome and next important is the dialysis disequilibrium syndrome so dialysis disequilibrium syndrome is that suddenly you are removing the solutes and there will be decrease in the osmolarity where there will be fluid shift into the cerebral neurons causing cerebral edema causing dialysis disequilibrium syndrome okay so this is about your hemodialysis and this hemodialysis you have to do thrice in a week then the peritoneal dialysis it can be done in the home as well and in the peritoneal dialysis the peritoneum itself will be acting as the membrane across which the impurities will get filtered right and the, the the solution that you will be infusing into the peritoneal cavity in peritoneal dialysis is it should be dextrose rich solution hmm? dextrose rich solution okay right so that will be right so if you take the high yield topics like the one what i am discussing in the nephrology high yield topics will be acute kidney injury chronic kidney injury nephrotic syndrome nephritic syndrome and renal tubular acidosis these are the five high yielding topics in case of nephrology yes shubham okay right now so we are done with the chronic renal failure now we will start with the renal tubular acidosis so if you take the renal tubular acidosis we have three types type 1 type 2 and as well as the type 4 you don't have type 3. So, in type 1, the pathology is in the collecting duct and the distal convulsive tubule. Whereas in type 2, the pathology is in the proximal convulsive tubule. And in type 4, pathology is in the distal convulsive tubule. And if you take the pathogenesis, what is the problem in case of your type 1? So, the problem in type 1 is there is failure of secretion of H plus ion in the collecting duct or the DCT. Failure of secretion of the H plus ion. So the H plus ion in the body increases and that will result in the acidosis. And in case of your type 2, the problem is failure of bicarbonate reabsorption at the level of bi uh, PCT. And thereby, there will be bicarbonate excretion. Your bicarbonate is an alkaline substance. So thereby, there will be decrease in alkalinity in the body resulting in acidosis. And in case of your type 4, it is the aldosterone deficiency or aldosterone resistance because aldosterone is the one which will cause H plus ion excretion. If aldosterone is not there, H plus ion is not excreted out and that will result in acidosis. And potassium levels, if you see, in type 1, you will have hypokalemia, type 2, you will have hypokalemia, type 4, you will have hyperkalemia. And you take the urinary pH, in type 1, it is more than 5.5 and in type 2, it is less than 5.5 and in type 4, it is more than 5.5. Right, and what are the drugs that will be causing is in type one, it is the amphotericin B that will be causing your type one. Type two, it is caused by acetazolamide. Right, and type four, it is caused by your AC inhibitors and spironolactone. Right, spironolactone and as well as the AC inhibitors. So, AC inhibitors and as well as angiotensin receptor blockers, they are the one which will be causing your type 4 renal tubular acidosis. And renal stone formation will be there only in case of your type 1, that too calcium stone formation. But in type 2 and type 4, there is no renal stone formation. And in type 1, what is the treatment? In type 1 and type 2, you need to give sodium bicarbonate. But what is the dosage of the sodium bicarbonate that you'll be giving in case of type 1 is 1 to 2 milli equivalents per kg. Whereas in type 2, the sodium bicarbonate that you should be giving is 10 to 15 milli equivalents per kg. Right? Whereas in type 4, we don't give sodium bicarbonate. What we give is fludrocortisone. So fludrocortisone, it is an aldosterone analog. Okay, so that is what is your type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Okay, so this completes the discussion of, right, so this completes the discussion of the types of renal tubular acidosis. And you have to remember that this renal tubular acidosis, it is hyperchloramic, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Right, hyperchloramic, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Whereas you take diabetic ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, it is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. 
Okay, diabetic ketoacidosis will be HAGMA, whereas your renal tubular acidosis will be NAGMA, that is normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay, so this completes the discussion of this important topic, that is renal tubular acidosis. Followed by that, you take the renal vascular conditions. The renal vascular conditions that we have is renal artery stenosis. So whenever there is renal artery stenosis, what will happen to the size of the kidney is the affected side, the kidney will be reduced. And what will be the minimum difference between the two kidneys, between the normal kidney and as well as the affected kidney? The size difference should be more than 1.5 centimeters. Right, the size difference should be more than 1.5 uh, centimeters between the affected kidney and as well as the normal kidney in case of the renal artery stenosis. And in case of renal artery stenosis, you need to know the etiology. So, most common cause of renal artery stenosis in elderly individuals will be atherosclerosis, whereas young individuals in India, right, young individuals in India, that will be your Takayasu arthritis, whereas in the West, it is the fibromuscular dysplasia, right? So this will be the etiologies that will be responsible for your renal artery stenosis. And the clinical features is that these patients will develop hypertension because of activation of RAS and because of which they will complain of the headache. And because of hypertension, there will be increased afterload on the left ventricle causing left ventricular failure. And once there is left ventricular failure, these patients will develop pulmonary edema and on examination what is that you will observe over the abdomen you over the abdomen you will listen a brewy and this brewy it is heard both during systole and as well as diastole that is what you will have on examination patients with the renal artery stenosis and what will be the first line investigation that is ultrasound abdomen where we will do renal artery doppler so across the renal artery doppler we will see the turbulence but what is the investigation of choice the investigation of choice will be the angiography right angiography renal artery angiography and that is the invasive procedure that will confirm your diagnosis but usually we do this uh, angiography mainly when we are planning the stenting right when mainly when we are planning the stenting we do this angiography to accurately place where exactly we need to make out the stent the treatment is, if it is unilateral renal artery stenosis, we give the AC inhibitors. But if it is bilateral renal artery stenosis, the AC inhibitors cannot be given. That will further worsen the renal failure uh, in case of bilateral renal artery stenosis if you give AC inhibitors. And in case of bilateral renal artery stenosis, what you can give is the calcium channel blockers or you can give levetolol can be given. right? And in case of the fibromuscular dysplasia, in case of the fibromuscular dysplasia causing renal artery stenosis, you need to do PTRA that we call it as percutaneous transluminal renal angioplasty. That is what is the treatment for your uh, renal artery stenosis secondary to fibromuscular dysplasia. Okay, so you can observe that here. This is like unilateral renal artery stenosis. In these patients, you can give the AC inhibitors or you can also give the angiotensin receptor blockers, right? And this is what is the stent. Okay, so this is what is your stent, that is your PTRA, percutaneous transluminal renal angioplasty, right? Yeah, yes, Shubham Verma, this rapid revision will be more than enough for your FMG exam, right? Because I am discussing every topic in a very concise and crisp manner, whichever is required for your FMG exam. This completes the discussion of your renal artery stenosis. And we are left with only two topics, that is your nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome, we will be done with the nephrology, okay? So coming to your nephrotic syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, they will have the proteinuria of more than 3.5 grams per 24 hours, right? And predominantly, which protein is being lost? That is al uh, albumin. So that is the reason why these patients will develop hypoalbuminemia. Along with albumin, the globulin is also being decreased and because of which these patients, they are more prone for infections, right? They are more prone for infections then there will be also loss of cholecalciferol binding protein. Because of loss of cholecalciferol binding protein, there will be hypocalcemia in these patients. And these patients, right, so these patients will also have loss of the transferrin. Because of loss of transferrin, these patients will develop what? They will develop hypochromic, microsotic hypochromic anemia because of decrease in iron levels. Right, and there will be also loss of ceruloplasmin due to which 
these patients will have abnormality in the copper metabolism. And there will be also thyroid abnormality because of loss of thyroxine binding globulin. And there will be also loss of the antithrombin 3 and there will be also loss of the protein C and as well as the protein S. And that will result in the hypercoagulability. Okay, that will result in the hypercoagulability. And they will have edema. Why? Because of hypoalbuminemia and because of decrease in your oncotic pressure. And dyslipidemia will be there. That is because of increase in the lipoproteins. That is increase in LDL and decrease in the real DL. And that will cause dyslipidemia. Right, because once your albumin levels are reduced, the synthetic capacity of the liver increases. And one among the synthetic capacity of the liver is increase in the lipoprotein levels as well, increase in LDL and VLDL, and that will cause the hyperlipidemia. So once there is hyperlipidemia, these patients will also have lipiduria. And one more important synthetic capacity of the liver is to increase the coagulation factors as well. And that will result in the hypercoagulability. So this will be the manifestations in patients with your nephrotic syndrome. So now, what are the etiologies that will be responsible for the development of nephrotic syndrome? One is minimal change disease. This is most commonly seen in case of children. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. This is most common in young adults, right? Or, or in this, I'm sorry. This uh, is more common in adults. In young adults, it is minimal change disease. And membranous glomerulonephritis, this is most common in elderly individuals. And diabetes mellitus, if you see, this is the most common systemic disease that will be responsible for the nephrotic syndrome. Most common systemic disease that is causing nephrotic syndrome will be diabetes mellitus. And other etiology that will be causing your nephrotic syndrome will be amyloidosis, right? Amyloidosis, okay? Next. Now, you see this question. Yes. So, 21-year-old uh, man presents with lethargy over the last week and he has periodical edema and proteinuria. The patient mentions he has been to hospital a number of times in the past due to same, same symptoms as well as eczema. Light microscopy renal biopsy showed normal morphology. Electron microscopy shows there is effacement of the epithelial podocytes and what is the most appropriate diagnosis that you will have in these patients? Yeah, appropriate treatment, sorry. So, yes. First of all, diagnosis is minimal change disease. And drug of choice will be your steroids. Right? Drug of choice will be your steroids. Okay? So, this is about your minimal change disease. Let me quickly recap now. So, minimal change disease, it can also occur secondary to this particular drugs. And what are the drugs that can cause minimal change disease is penicillamine or even your gold salts, right? Even it can be secondary to infections, that is the Epstein-Barr virus and as well as the HIV. And what will be the clinical presentation of the child? The clinical presentation of the child will be edema. The clinical presentation of the child will be edema. And light microscopy, you will observe there is no abnormality at all. Right? There is no abnormality in the light microscopy. Whereas electron microscopy, you will notice that there is effacement of the food process. Right? Effacement of the polocytes. Right? And fluorescent microscopy, it will show you that there is no IgG or C3. And drug of choice will be steroids. Okay, And in those individuals where there is steroid refractory or steroid dependent minimal change disease, in them you need to give cyclophosphamide or the other alternative will be cyclosporin. Okay, cyclosporin. So this will be, yeah, electron microscopy will show you the effacement of the food process. And that is because of loss of membrane polyanion, that is heparon sulfate. The heparon sulfate is being lost. And that is the reason why you have effacement of the porocytes. So this is about the clinical picture that you will have in patients with the minimal change disease. And minimal change disease, this is more common in children. And this is more common in young adults. Now, what is the age of a young adult? When we use the word young adult, the age should be less than 40 years. Right, the age should be less than 40 years. That is what is your minimal change disease, right? Then coming to the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So in case of the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, you, you need to understand that this is the most common cause of the nephrotic syndrome in adults. 
right? Most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults. And what are the primary causes? Primary and secondary FSGS will be there. So primary FSGS is secondary to the gene mutation. And that gene mutation is the APOL1 gene mutation. Okay. Whereas secondary FSGS, it is secondary to infection. And that could be secondary to your HIV. And this we call it as the HIV associated nephropathy. And even in obesity, you can have this secondary FSGS. And clinical features you will have similar to that of nephrotic syndrome. But the additional manifestation that you will have in these patients will be hematuria. Right? And you need to take the biopsy from the corticomedullary junction. Superficial biopsy may miss the diagnosis. And what is that you will have? You will notice the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So you need to take the biopsy from corticomedullary junction. And light microscopy, you will observe that it is only few glomeruli which are being affected. And it is only the part of the glomerulus which is being affected. Right? Only part of the glomerulus which will be affected. And you will notice that there is fibrosis. Whereas the electron microscopy will show you the presence of the deposits. That is mesangial and as well as, okay. So in case of the electron microscopy, you will notice that the fibrous tissue accumulation is causing thickening of the glomeruli. Is causing thickening of the glomeruli. Okay. That can, you can observe within the electron microscopy. And treatment, you need to give steroids in these patients. And these steroids will be mainly useful only for primary. Then the remaining treatment will be similar to that of all others. Like you need to give diuretics because there is edema. Salt restriction, fluid restriction should be given. ACE inhibitor should be given because there is proteinuria. All that will be similar to that of the nephrotic syndrome. All other forms of nephrotic syndrome. Steroids should be given only in case of primary. Whereas in secondary, you need to treat the underlying cause. Right? You need to treat the underlying cause. Okay? So this is about your, yeah, so this is about your focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Then these patients with focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, this we call it as reflux nephropathy, right? Reflux nephropathy. There is reflux that will happen. That will be causing glomerulosclerosis in patients with the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And this is what is your focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, where only the part of the glomerulus will undergo glomerulosclerosis, right? This is what is your FSGS. Followed by the FSGS, okay. Now, one clinical question, any one of you? We have a 19-year-old man is recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus and attends your clinic to ask the possible complication in the future. He mentions an uncle who had an end-stage renal disease due to poorly controlled diabetes and specifically inquires about testing for early signs of renal impairment. The most appropriate investigation in these individuals will be. Yes. What is that you want to test for? Very good. So, in case of diabetic nephropathy, what is the earliest manifestation is? The earliest manifestation will be in the form of microalbuminuria. The earliest manifestation will be in the form of microalbuminuria. Now, let me discuss about the diabetic nephropathy. So, when will these patients develop diabetic nephropathy is your HbA1c, if it is more than 7, there is chance of development of diabetic nephropathy. And it is your HbA1c, which is a marker of the microvascular complications. Okay. More is your HbA1c, more is the chances of your microvascular complications. Now, in case of your diabetic nephropathy, what may be the renal manifestations? The renal manifestations will be in the form, see, in early stages of diabetic nephropathy, there will be increase in the GFR. Right? In the later stages, the GFR will be reduced. Right? GFR will be reduced in the later stages. And the earliest manifestation will be in the form of the proteinuria or earlier clinical presentation will be in the form of proteinuria and that is the microalbuminuria will be there where these patients will come and tell you that there is frothy urine and that is because of your proteinuria and size of the kidneys if you take in case of diabetic nephropathy in early stages the size of the kidneys will be increased but in the later stages right in the later stages the size of the kidneys will be reduced that is what you will observe related to the size of the kidneys microalbuminuria when will you tell when the protein is around 30 to 300 milligrams per 24 hours if it is excreted then we use the word called microalbuminuria and when will you use the word macroalbuminuria when the proteinuria is more than 
300 milligrams per 24 hours, then we use the word macroalbuminuria. Then you take the biopsy. Biopsy is the investigation of choice. In the biopsy, you will have diffuse glomerulosclerosis and you also have nodular glomerulosclerosis. But between these two, which is more common is diffuse glomerulosclerosis is more common. And in case of diffuse, what is the earliest manifestation? The earliest manifestation is that you will have thick glomerular basement membrane. That is the earliest manifestation. Then nodular glomerulosclerosis, these are pathognomic for your diabetic nephropathy. And these are nothing but your KW lesions. That is nothing but your Kimmel steel Wilson's lesions. And treatment, you need to give insulin in order to ensure that the glucose levels are less than 7. But metformin can we give? Yes, metformin can be given. But you should stop metformin if the estimated GFR, if it is less than 30, then you need to stop the metformin. Then you need to switch to insulin. Because in renal failure, when you give metformin, there will be precipitation of your lactic acidosis. That is the reason why metformin should not be given if the estimated GFR is less than 30. Okay. Then some books give even 20 as well. So you can just take the value as 20 to 30. Then next is you need to give the AC inhibitors. Why is that you need to give AC inhibitors? The AC inhibitors you need to give mainly to reduce the proteinuria because AC inhibitors will reduce the intraglomerular pressures, thereby they will reduce the proteinuria. And the next important is there are the drugs which will prevent the progression of your diabetic nephropathy and that will be your SGLT2 inhibitors. They prevent the progression of your diabetic nephropathy. Okay, so this completes the discussion related to your diabetic nephropathy, right? Moving on to the next important topic in case of your nephrotic syndrome. Right, so the next will be your membranous glomerulonephritis. Membranous glomerulonephritis, this is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in elderly individuals. Right, most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in elderly individuals. Here also you have the primary and as well as the secondary. So primary causes for membranous glomerulonephritis, that is mainly because of your gene mutation. And the secondary causes for your membranous glomerulonephritis will be autoimmune conditions like Graves, malignancies like your oat cell carcinoma, your bronchogenic carcinoma, then you also have the infections like your viral hepatitis, that is your hepatitis B and as well as hepatitis C. Clinical features, you will have all the features of your nephrotic syndrome, but the additional manifestation that you will have in patients with membranous glomerulonephritis is renal vein thrombosis. So renal vein thrombosis, the most common cause for renal vein thrombosis, that will be your membranous glomerulonephritis. Okay, then you take the biopsy. Light microscopy will show you that there is thickening of glomerular basement membrane. And electron microscopy will show you the presence of the subepithelial deposits. And because of the subepithelial deposits, you will notice that there is glomerular basement membrane thickening, right? Then the fluorescent microscopy will show you the presence of IgG and as well as the C3. And treatment, drug of choice will be steroids, but only with steroids, this will not suffice. You need to give either cyclophosphamide or cyclosporin should be given, right? Mycophenolate morphetal. So these are the drugs that you need to give in the treatment of membranous glomerulonephritis, okay? So this completes the discussion of your nephrotic syndrome in crisp and concise manner, come considering all the topics, okay? Then coming to the nephritic syndrome. So nephritic syndrome, you will have proteinuria, but the proteinuria in nephritic will be less than that of your nephrotic syndrome. And how much will be that? Less than 3 grams per 24 hours. And because of this proteinuria, and again here also it is albumin which is being excreted out, and that will cause edema in these patients also. But the peculiar difference between your nephritic and nephrotic syndrome is the presence of hematuria. Usually in case of nephrotic, you don't have hematuria except for focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. But hematuria, it is present in all the cases of the nephritic syndrome. Then oliguria, where the urine output will be less than 400 ml per 24 hours. Right, less than 400 ml per 24 hours. And edema is present in these individuals and that is because of your hypoalbuminemia. And hypertension is present in all the cases of your nephritic syndrome. You have an exception where in IgA nephropathy, right, you have an exception. In IgA nephropathy, you don't have the hypertension. In these individuals, the blood pressure will be absolutely normal. 
right? Blood pressure will be absolutely normal in case of your the IgA nephropathy. Whereas in post streptococcal glomerulonephritis and a good pasture syndrome, they will have hypertension in these individuals. Now, let me discuss. Okay, please answer this question. 17-year-old patient referred by general practitioner presenting with periorteal edema. The patient noticed edematous eyes three days ago, but reports uh, feeling unwell since the throat infection three weeks ago with nausea and vomiting in the last week. Urine dipstick is positive for protein and as well as blood, while serum creatinine in urea mildly deranged. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Right, so <clears throat> these patients, they have developed post streptococcal glomerulonephritis because it is secondary to th your throat infection almost three weeks ago. This is your PSGN. So this PSGN, it is caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection. Caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection. And here you have the deposition of the immune complexes within the glomeruli. So if it is deposition of the immune complexes, this will become your type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Right, And this group A beta hemolytic septococcal skin infection or throat infection is the one which will be causing your post septococcal glomerulonephritis. So you take secondary to your skin infection. This is more common in summer. And this we call it as impetigo. Right, This we call it as impetigo. Right, And secondary to throat infection, this is more common in winter. And this is nothing but your pharyngitis. Okay, and you take the latent period. Immediately, there will not be development of your PSGN. So after the skin infection, after three to one to three weeks of your skin infection, there can be development of PSGN. After three to six weeks of pharyngitis, there can be development of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And if you take the in, and clinical features will be what similar to that of all the patients with nephritic syndrome. So these patients, may, this is commonly seen in children, and these children they present with. The polar colored urine, right? Polar colored urine or hematuria will be there. And if you take the biopsy in these patients, the light microscopy, you will notice that there is thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, right? Electron microscopy will show you the presence of the subepithelial deposits, right? And you will also notice the neutrophilic infiltrates. Okay, in the light microscopy, you will also observe the neutrophilic infiltrates. Okay, and fluorescent microscopy will show you the starry sky appearance. Okay, starry sky appearance. Now, some quick questions. Can anyone tell me where do you have the starry sky appearance in the CT scan? So, starry sky appearance, subepithelial. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you are correct, actually. It is. Yeah, CT scan uh, showing starry sky appearance. You have this in case of the neurocysticercosis. And lymph node biopsy showing the starry sky appearance. Lymph node biopsy showing starry sky appearance. And ultrasound abdomen showing starry sky appearance. Yeah, so in Burkitt's lymphoma, you have the lymph node biopsy. And ultrasound abdomen showing starry sky appearance, that will be in case of your viral hepatitis. That is in case of viral hepatitis, you have the starry sky appearance. Okay. And renal biopsy showing starry sky appearance will be your post septococcal glomerulonephritis. And treatment is that it is completely symptomatic treatment. These patients will have the hypertension. So you need to give antihypertensive drugs that is in the form of levetilol, right? And uh, there is no specific drug in these patients. We don't give antibiotics. There is no role of the antibiotics because the infection, whichever is there, it is not the recent infection. It was the infection which was there almost like one to three weeks back or so three to six weeks back. So that is the reason why there is no role of the antibiotics that you need to give in these patients. Okay. And the next is the fluid restriction. And how is the recurrence that you see in these patients with the post-septococcal glomerulonephritis? The recurrence, it is very, very rare. Right? The recurrence is rare. Okay. And the prognosis is good. Right? The prognosis is good. So there will be complete resolution in these patients. So that is about the prognosis in patients with the post-septococcal glomerulonephritis. So this is about your PSGN. We are done with the PSGN. 
right? Now, what is the difference between rheumatic fever and PSGNS? Rheumatic fever will develop secondary to group A beta hemolytic streptococcal only throat infection, not after the skin infection, which one rheumatic fever. Whereas PSGN, it will occur secondary to group A beta hemolytic streptococcal throat infection and as well as the skin infection. Okay. Next, coming to your IG nephropathy. IG nephropathy, this is also called as the Burgess. Right? Or it is also called mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis. Right? Mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis. And your IG nephropathy, if you take the etiology, it is two to four days back, right? Two to four days back, upper respiratory tract infection or the gastrointestinal infection. Okay, so secondary to this infection, the IgA antibody is formed. That IgA antibody which is formed secondary to that infection will go and accumulate within the glomerulus causing the IgA nephropathy. And that too in the mesangial cells causing mesangial proliferation. And that is called mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis. And these patients, they will have recurrent gross hematuria. Right, recurrent gross hematuria. So that will be the clinical presentation in patients with the IgN. So the difference between IgN nephropathy and as well as your uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is the recurrence is very common in IgN nephropathy, but there is no recurrence in PSGN. And the next point is in case of PSGN, the ASO titer is elevated, but whereas in, a in IgN nephropathy, the ASO titer is normal, right? So, and in the biopsy, biopsy is the investigation of choice. And in the patients with the IgN nephropathy, you will observe that there is presence of, in light microscopy, you will notice that there is mesangial proliferation. Right? There is mesangial proliferation. And in electron microscopy, you will notice mesangial and as well as paramesangial deposits. Right? Mesangial and paramesangial deposits. And fluorescent microscopy will show you the presence of IgA. And please remember, your serum IgA has no value. Right, serum IgA does not have any value. It is the fluorescent microscopy IgA is having the value. Okay, serum IgA, there is no role in the diagnosis. Right, it may be elevated, it may be normal also. And recurrence, it is very common in patients with the IgA nephropathy. And the treatment that we give is steroids. And in these individuals, along with steroids, we also need to add azathioprine. We don't give steroids or immunosuppressive agents in case of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. We give that only in case of your IgA nephropathy. So this completes the discussion of your IgA nephropathy, which is also called Berger's disease or mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis. The next one is the GPS, good pasture syndrome. So good pasture syndrome, it is an autoimmune disease. And the type of hypersensitivity reaction is antibodies are being formed. So it is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. So the antibodies, they are formed against your glomerular basement membrane and as well as the alveolar basement membrane. Right? Glomerular basement membrane and alveolar basement membrane. So, once the, so the antibodies are formed against your alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen. Right? Alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen which is present in the glomerular basement membrane and alveolar basement membrane. So accordingly in the kidneys, these patients will have the hematuria, right? And in the lungs, these patients will have hemoptysis, all right? And the very important point is there will be focal necrosis of the alveoli. It is not diffuse necrosis of the alveoli, focal necrosis of the alveoli. But you will have diffuse, diffuse bilateral hemorrhage. Right, bilateral hemorrhage will be there, and that will be responsible for hemoptysis. So there is hematuria and as well as the hemoptysis. And when you do a biopsy, mainly the electron microscopy will show you the presence of the linear deposits across the glomerular basement membrane. And what is that linear deposits that you will have? The linear deposits of the antibodies that you will have across the glomerular basement membrane. Right. And what is the treatment that you need to give in these individuals? Okay. So the treatment first. Okay. And one more, the chest x-ray. Chest x-ray will show you the presence of bilateral infiltrates and that is because of your hemorrhage, right? And in these individuals, the ANCA will be negative. And the treatment that you need to give in these individuals first is you need to do plasmapheresis. 
Okay. So by doing plasma pheresis, you will remove the existing antibodies. Now, after doing plasma pheresis, you need to give steroids in order to prevent the new antibody formation. In order to prevent the new antibody formation, you need to give steroids, right? Uh, and some individuals, they may also require the azathioprine as well, okay? So this is about the treatment of the good pasture syndrome, right? And you see this clinical question. A 42-year-old diabetic Asian male complains of dysuria, increased urinary frequency, and generalized malaise for the past six months. In the past few days, he has noticed blood in the urine. Examination of the urine shows the presence of the neutrophils, no organisms detected on the urine culture. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis in these patients? Yeah, yes, uh, we also give the intravenous immunoglobulins as well. That is also one of the alternative for your good pasture syndrome. Right? Yeah. So what is the answer in this individual? Uh, no, it is not bladder cancer. It is not nephritic syndrome. It is not bladder cancer. It is not nephritic syndrome also. In bladder cancer, why there should be neutrophils? Yeah, we have one answer correct. Yeah, multi-star, you are correct. That is tuberculosis. Okay. So you don't have organisms there. So what is this now? This will be your sterile pyuria. So what is the condition where you will have sterile pyuria? You will have that in case of tuberculosis, right? You will have that in case of tuberculosis. Okay. And he has noticed blood in the uh, urine examination, right? That can be seen in case of renal tuberculosis. And this urea, and as well as urinary frequency, that will tell you, suggest you of urinary tract infection. And when there is presence of RBC, you can suspect the pyelonephritis. It need not be always. If there is cast, you can suspect pyelonephritis. But if it is this only RBC, it need not be your pyelonephritis. It can be just only the hematuria, okay? So the answer in this question is your renal tuberculosis. It is not your malignancy. Okay, right. So this completes the discussion of your nephrology. So we have discussed nephrotic nephritic syndrome, acute renal failure, chronic renal failure, renal tubular astrosis. And we are done with the nephrology important topics. Now, let us start with the uh, respiratory system, right? So we are done with the endocrinology. We are done with the nephrology. Coming to the respiratory system, the first topic will be your ARDS, the acute respiratory distress syndrome. So acute respiratory distress syndrome, it is a disorder where these patients will present with acute onset dyspnea, right? There are multiple conditions where you have acute onset dyspnea. What are the differential diagnosis for acute onset dyspnea is pulmonary embolism, then tension pneumothorax, right? Then foreign body aspiration, Right then, cardiac tamponade. Right then, left ventricular failure causing pul acute pulmonary edema. Then, acute exacerbation of the COPD. Then, acute exacerbation of the bronchial asthma. So, these are all the conditions where you will have the acute onset dyspnea. Uh, Harjit, uh, ABG kal padaunga mai. Right? Tomorrow we will do the ABG part. Okay, don't worry about it. Okay? Right. Now, so these are all the conditions where you will have the acute onset dyspnea. Then you take the type of edema that you will have in patients with ARDS will be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Whereas in case of left ventricular failure, you will have cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema means your left atrial pressure will be absolutely normal. Your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will also be absolutely normal. Okay. And in these individuals, with the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, how will you measure the left atrial pressure is with the help of Swan-Gans catheter. So Swan-Gans catheter will show you that there is normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. How much is the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? That is around 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury will be the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And what is the most common cause of ARDS? Sepsis will be the most common cause for ARDS. And what is the most common direct lung injury causing ARDS? DLI means direct lung injury causing ARDS. Most common direct lung injury causing ARDS will be pneumonia, whereas the most common indirect lung injury, right, most common indirect lung injury causing the ARDS, that will be again sepsis. And we also have some drugs that will be contributing the development of the ARDS. And what will be these particular drugs? These drugs include cocaine. Then your phenothysines. <laughs> 
Okay, so these are the drugs that will be contributing the development of the ARDS. Now, if you take this ARDS, we have three phases. What are these three phases in ARDS is you have exudative phase where there is fluid shift from the capillary into the alveoli. And you also have collapse of the alveoli because of damage to your type 1 and as well as type 2 pneumocytes are damaged. Because of damage to your type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, the surfactant is being lost. There will be collapse of the alveoli right and that that will be the first phase and the second phase will be your fibroproliferative phase in case of the fibroproliferative phase there will be influx of the fibroblast and there will be proliferation of your fibroblast and the last one will be your fibrotic phase right last one will be your fibrotic phase where there is excessive accumulation of the fibrous tissue within the lung and that will give rise to bilateral white out lung in patients with the ARDS Right now, what is the criteria in patients with ARDS? That is called Berlin's criteria. And remember this criteria is ARDS. The word A stands for acute in onset. That means within one week of the clinical insult or within one week of the etiology, the individual should be developing this particular ARDS. R stands for reduced PaO2 by FiO2. And how much should be that? That should be less than 300. Okay. And D stands for diffuse bilateral infiltrates. That is because of the accumulation of your fibrous tissue. Then S stands for your Swan-Gans catheter showing the left atrial pressure being normal. Okay. So this is what is a criteria, which is nothing but your Berlin's criteria. Right. And just one minute. Right. So you take the uh, CVRT according to your Berlin's criteria. The CVRT according to the, your Berlin's criteria, what will happen to your PaO2 by FiO2? So if the PaO2 by FiO2, if it is in between 200 to 300, that is called as mild form of ARDS. When if PaO2 by FiO2, if it is in between 100 to 200, that is moderate form of the ARDS. And if the PaO2 by FiO2, if it is less than 100, then it is cut nothing but your severe form of the ARDS. So this is what is nothing but your Berlin's criteria. And what is the treatment that you will give in patients with ARDS? These patients have to be placed on mechanical ventilator. And the tidal volume that you need to keep in these individuals is 6 ml per kg should be the tidal volume. And how much should be the PEEP, positive and expiratory pressure? That is around 10 centimeters of water that should be the, your mechanical ventilatory settings. And these patients, you also need to give antibiotics because the most common cause for AR, ARDS is sepsis. And that is the reason why you need to give the broad spectrum antibiotics in these patients. So that is about the story of your ARDS. So ARDS is done, right? ARDS is done, ARDS is over. Then we will move on to the next topic that is pleural effusion. So if you take this pleural effusion, what is the normal quantity of the fluid in the pleural space? The normal quantity of the fluid, it is accumulated at a rate of 0.01 ml per kg. At this particular rate, the fluid will be keep on accumulating within the pleural space. And the normal fluid levels will be around 5 to 15 ml. And if the fluid levels is more than 15, then we consider it as the pleural effusion, right? And how do we classify this pleural effusion is based on whether it is the based on the protein content. In case of the the transudative, the protein content will be less than 3 grams per deciliter, whereas in exudative, it is more than 3 grams per deciliter. And pure fluid protein to the serum protein, that should be less than 0.5 in transudative, and it is more than 0.5 in case of exudative. And pure fluid LDH to the serum LDH, it should be less than 0.6 in transudative, more than 0.6 in case of the exudative, right? And what do you understand by this word chylus effusion? Chylus effusion means there will be excessive lymph. Okay, excessive lymph. There will be increase in the triglyceride levels. And this increase in triglycerides will be more than 100 milligrams per deciliter within the pleural fluid. And these three together, in case of the exudative type of pleural effusion, we call it this as the lights criteria. Right, lights criteria, and if any one out of these three are present, then it is considered as the exudative type of pleural effusion. Then coming to the hemorrhagic pleural effusion, 
so hemorrhagic pleural effusion this can occur here along with rbc you also have the presence of the fluid right and the number of rbc will be more than 10000 per cubic millimeter in case of hemorrhagic pleural effusion whereas you take in case of right you take in case of the hemothorax in case of hemothorax you have the presence of only blood right and the number of rbcs will be more than 1 lakh rbc per cubic millimeter and if you take the pleural fluid hematocrit right pleural fluid hematocrit to that of the serum hematocrit that will be more than 0.5 right that will be more than 0.5 Okay, so that is how you will be able to make out it is the hemothorax. Then coming to the important points, that is the tuberculous pleural effusion. So in case of the tuberculous pleural effusion, you need to understand that the interferon gamma levels will be elevated. Your ADA levels will be elevated. That will be more than 45 international units per ml. Then your TB PCR will be positive, and we do what is called gene expert, right? Gene expert in case of the tuberculous pleural effusion. Then, in which condition the amylase levels are increased in case of the pleural fluid? That is in case of pancreatitis causing pleural effusion. You can have amylase levels being elevated. And what are the conditions where cholesterol crystals are elevated in the pleural fluid? You come across this in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and as well as the hypothyroidism causing pleural effusion, you will have the cholesterol crystals being elevated. So how will you diagnose these patients with pleural effusion? That will be your chest x-ray. Chest x-ray, what is the earliest manifestation? The earliest manifestation is blunting of the costophrenic angle. Right? Blunting of the costophrenic angle. So this will be the chest x-ray. So this will be your costophrenic angle that will be blunted. And these patients will have the presence of the homogeneous opacity. And what will happen to the trachea? The trachea, it is being shifted to the opposite side. Right? The trachea is being shifted to the opposite side. And you have a curve. And this is what is nothing but your LSS shaped curve. Right? This is called LSS shaped curve. Okay? And what is this X-ray which is adjacent to here is... This is the X-ray of the hydroneumothorax. So in case of the hydroneumothorax, you have the presence of the air and as well as the fluid. So you have what is called the horizontal fluid level. Right? You have what is called the horizontal fluid level. So that is what you will have in patients with the hydroneumothorax. Okay? And these patients with hydroneumothorax, whenever you rigorously shake the patient, you will find what is called as the succussion splash. Right? You will find what is called succussion splash. Okay? So that is what in case of the hydroneumothorax. Now, what is the treatment in these individuals? You need to treat the underlying cause. Right? And if the pleural fluid is like massive pleural effusion causing symptoms, then you need to do pluricentesis. And when you are doing pluricentesis, you have to insert the needle in the sixth intercostal space, mid-axial relay. Okay, so that is what, and whenever there is recurrent pleural effusion, recurrent pleural effusion, what you can do is, you can do what is called pleurodesis. Right, pleurodesis is like where we will obliterate the pleural space. And for obliterating the pleural space, we use the talc, we use or we use this povidone iodine, or we give bleomycin. Okay, so that is how you do pleurodesis. And the next important is we do tube thoracostomy in case of pleural effusion when there is loculated pleural effusion. So when there is loculated pleural effusion, we do what is called tube thoracostomy. Okay, and we give tissue plasminogen activator. So tissue plasminogen activator will cause thrombolysis of this biofilms of this loculated pleural effusion. So that is about your the pleural effusion story, right? Then followed by that, the next important uh, emergency is nothing but your uh, pneumothorax. So pneumothorax, as I have said you, the hallmark of these patients with the pneumothorax is that there will be collapse of the lung, right? There will be collapse of the lung. 
So we have what is called uh, various forms of pneumothorax. In case of traumatic pneumothorax, these patients will develop what is called tension pneumothorax. What do you understand with this word tension pneumothorax? Tension pneumothorax is an emergency scenario where there is not only collapse of the lung. As a result of collapse, the lung will push the mediastinum to the opposite side. So there will be compression of the vessels which are present within the mediastinum. So venous return will be reduced and that will cause vascular collapse in these patients. So that is the reason why this is a very important medical emergency and the auscultation in case of the pneumothorax, you will have amphoric breath sounds. Whereas actually in case of pneumothorax, your breath sounds are absent. But in tension pneumothorax, you have amphoric breath sounds. And what is the first line treatment that you will be doing in these patients? First line treatment is, you need to take the whiteboard needle. Right? You need to take the whiteboard needle and puncture the pleura. Right? Whiteboard needle and puncture the pleura. And you have to do that in the Second intercostal space, whiteboard needle puncture of the pleura should be done in the second intercostal space. And ultimately, these patients, they will be requiring an underwater seal in order to ensure that the remaining air is completely drained out. And for doing this, you need to put, you need to pierce across the fifth intercostal space and you need to pass the tube up to the level of the apex. Why? Because the air accumulates at the apex. So that's why the, the tube has to be pushed up to the apex, right? And what is the important chest X-ray finding in patients with your pneumothorax? The chest X-ray findings is that they will have hyperuse and lung fields where there is excessive accumulation of air. Your trachea will be shifted to the opposite side. You can see that here, right? Then absence of bronchovascular markings. So because the lung is collapsed, bronchovascular markings will be absent. Then primary and secondary pneumothorax. So primary pneumothorax, it is observed in tall, thin male smokers, like Marfan's. Secondary pneumothorax, you have an underlying lung pathology. You have a form of pneumothorax called as catamenial pneumothorax. So catamenial pneumothorax is that which is observed in case of the females, right? That is, females with pulmonary endometriosis, Right, females with pulmonary endometriosis, in them you have this catamenial pneumothorax. With every menstrual cycle, they develop this pneumothorax that is called catamenial pneumothorax. And clinical features in patients with pneumothorax, there will be sudden onset dyspnea. And on examination, you will observe that respiratory rate is increased and heart rate is also increased. And on auscultation, the breath sounds will be absent because the lung is collapsed. And chest X-ray, just now we have discussed. Treatment also we have just now discussed. So this is about your pneumothorax stone. Okay? Right. So this finishes the topic of your pneumothorax. And in pneumothorax, when you take the chest X-ray in supine position, right, when you take the chest X-ray in supine position, you will notice this deep sulcus sign. You will observe what is called as the deep sulcus sign. Okay, right. This is what is your deep sulcus sign where the air will insinuate into the costophrenic angle and there will be accumulation of the air. And this is what is called as the deep sulcus sign. Then, then followed by that, the next important topic is the pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolism, these patients also, they present with what? These patients also, they present with sudden onset dyspnea. That is because of your right ventricular failure. So what is the difference between massive, submassive and low risk pulmonary embolism is, in case of massive pulmonary embolism, there will be right ventricular failure and there will be also hypotension, right? And these patients, they will have sudden onset dyspnea. Whereas submassive pulmonary embolism, these patients, right ventricular failure will be absent. But hypotension will be there in these patients with submassive pulmonary embolism. And sudden onset dyspnea will be there even in patients with the submassive pulmonary embolism also. Whereas low risk pulmonary embolism, right ventricular failure will be absent and blood pressure will be absolutely normal. And these patients, they will develop gradual onset dyspnea. It is not like sudden onset dyspnea. Gradual onset dyspnea will be there in patients with the low risk pulmonary embolism. Okay. Then in patients with pulmonary embolism, what is the investigation of choice? The investigation of choice will be your CT pulmonary angiography. That will be the investigation of choice. 
then in pregnancy you cannot do ct pulmonary angiography what is the second line investigation the second line investigation will be the ventilation perfusion scan and we have few more investigation that you need to do in case of pulmonary embolism and what are those few more investigations is okay before that you you, have, you there are two questions here what is the most common site of dvt most common site of dvt will be in the calf veins okay and what is the most common source of pulmonary embolism most common source of the pulmonary embolism will be in the iliac veins right or the femoral veins okay that will be the most common source of the pulmonary embolism okay then the ecg finding in patients with pulmonary embolism most common ecg finding that will be your sinus tachycardia that you will have in patients with the pulmonary embolism so you can count the heart rate in these individual it is around 150 per minute and what are the other ecg findings the other ecg findings in patients with pulmonary embolism is right axis deviation right ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular strain so right ventricular strain is nothing but where you will have the t wave inversions and that particular t wave inversions will be asymmetrical t wave inversions okay and only in case of massive pulmonary embolism you have this s1 q3 t3 pattern where you will have deep s wave in lead 1 and you have deep q wave in lead 3 and t wave inversion in lead 3 that is what is called s1 q3 t3 pattern which you see in case of only massive pulmonary embolism and chest x ray is very very important right where you have hampton sum the hampton sum it is nothing but the presence of the wedge shaped infarct in patients with the pulmonary embolism then you take this pallas sign pallas sign is that where you have the presence of enlarged right descending pulmonary artery that is what is called pallas sign and that is because of your pulmonary hypertension and western mark sign it is nothing but pulmonary oligemia right pulmonary oligemia that is what is called as western mark sign these three are the important signs in patients with the pulmonary embolism and when you do a 2d echo you get this particular characteristic sign called macconnell sign what is this macconnell sign is right ventricular free wall right that will be hypokinetic whereas the apex will be hyperkinetic right the apex will be hyperkinetic so this is what is called as the macconnell sign seen in patients with the pulmonary embolism right and next important is treatment in patients with the pulmonary embolism so low risk pulmonary embolism we don't have any other choice you need to give the anticoagulants but intermediate risk or submassive pulmonary embolism the treatment completely depends upon the age of the patient if suppose if the individual is a young individual right if the individual is a young individual okay you need to do a thrombolysis whereas if the individual is an elderly individual then you need to give anticoagulants but whereas in massive pulmonary embolism we do, we have only one option that is thrombolysis but if there is any hemorrhagic tendency then you need to do embolectomy right you need to do embolectomy okay so this is what is the treatment in patients with your pulmonary embolism depending upon the cvrt of pulmonary embolism okay this completes the topic of your p pulmonary embolism right done then followed by that okay in submassive pulmonary embolism right you need to do a small change here okay in submassive pulmonary embolism the right ventricular failure will be there i'm very sorry right ventricular failure will be present and hypotension will be absent mm, hypotension will be absent hypotension will be there only in case of massive pulmonary embolism all right so this is about your story of the pulmonary embolism then after pulmonary embolism the next important topic is the copd that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease we have two forms one is emphysema the other one is the chronic bronchitis so in case of your emphysema or in patients with copd which airways are affected it is the smaller airways smaller airways means where the airway size will be less than 2 mm and there will be absence of cartilage right there will be absence of the cartilage c shaped cartilage in the strings will not be there in patients with your smaller airways and in these individuals with 
emphysema, not only emphysema, uh, chronic bronchitis, and in patients with the bronchial asthma, it is a smaller airway disease. And even in patients with the hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it is the smaller airway disease. Okay. And which part of the airway is affected in patients with emphysema? So totally 23 generations are affected. Out of these 23 generations, the one which is present distal to the terminal bronchiole is abnormally irreversibly dilated in patients with emphysema. Respiratory bronchiole, alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and alveoli, that is abnormally irreversibly dilated. And this entire structure, we call this as the asinus. This entire structure, we call this as asinus. And this is useful for the air exchange. And depending upon which part of the asinus is affected, we classify the emphysema as the panasinar emphysema, where the entire asinus is abnormally and irreversibly dilated. And this is very commonly seen in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And which lungs are affected mainly? It is the lower lobes which are commonly affected. Whereas centriasinar emphysema, it is only the proximal part of the asinus is being affected. That is mainly the respiratory bronchioles are abnormally irreversibly dilated. And centriasinar emphysema, it is very commonly seen in smokers. And which lungs are affected is the upper lobes of the lungs are affected. And paracetal emphysema is that it is mainly the distal part of the asinus that will be your alveolar sac and as well as the alveoli, they are abnormally irreversibly dilated. And this paraceptal emphysema, the peripheral part of the lung is commonly affected, right? And these patients with paraceptal emphysema, they are at increased risk of development of the pneumothorax, right? They are at increased risk of development of pneumothorax. That will be your paraceptal emphysema. Then you take the chest X-ray. Chest X-ray in patients with emphysema, you will notice that there is bilateral hyperlucent lung fields, right? Bilateral hyperlucent lung fields. And the trachea in these individuals will be centrally placed. And the diaphragm, it will be low set diaphragm, right? And how will be the heart? It is like tubular heart. Actually, it is not tubular heart. But the two lungs which are abnormally irreversibly dilated will overlap the heart. And that is the reason why it will give you a picture of vertical heart or the tubular heart. And the pulmonary function test will show you an obstructive pattern. Right? So obstructive pattern in the sense your FEV1 by FVC will be reduced to less than 70%. And not only that, in patients with emphysema, your DLCO is also reduced. Diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide is also Reduced. So that is what is your emphysema. Treatment, I'll tell you both emphysema and chronic bronchitis subsequently. Now, coming to your chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis, like very important is these patients, they present with cough with mucoid expectoration. This cough with mucoid expectoration, that will be there for nearly around three months and two consecutive years. Right? Three months and two consecutive years. And very important, how, when, how can you assess the CVRT of chronic bronchitis is by your read index. What is the read index? It is the thickness of the submucosal glands to that of the entire bronchial wall. Okay. So that is the thickness of the submucosal glands to that of the entire bronchial wall. That is what is nothing but your read index. The normal individuals, the read index is the 0.44. Whereas in patients with chronic bronchitis, this will be 0.52 because there will be increase in the thickness of the mucous glands in patients with the chronic bronchitis. So that is the reason why read index is increased in patients with the chronic bronchitis. So more is your read index, more severe is your chronic bronchitis. And appearance of these individuals, if you see, they are considered as blue bloaters. Why? Because of the presence of the cyanosis. Whereas emphysema patients, they are considered as the pink puffers because there is no cyanosis. And these patients, they are more prone for infections because there is mucus production. This mucus will be acting as a seat of infection. That is the reason why these patients are more prone for infections. And you take the corpal milk. These patients, they will have more commonly right heart failure than compared to that of the emphysema patients. Then chronic bronchitis, what will be the chest x-ray is there will be increased bronchovascular markings, right? There will be increased bronchovascular markings. So that is what you will observe in patients with the chronic bronchitis. Then you take the 
that will be your chest x-ray increased bronchovascular markings or prominent bronchovascular markings and respiratory failure if you see in these individuals they will have your type 2 respiratory failure right so type 2 respiratory failure in the sense they will have hypoxia and as well as the hypercapnia whereas you take in patients with emphysema in patients with emphysema they will have type 1 respiratory failure where they will have hypoxia but the carbon dioxide levels they may be normal or they may be decreased. That is what you will have in patients with the emphysema. And in patients with chronic bronchitis, when you do an ABG, ABG will show you the presence of respiratory acidosis because of increase in the carbon dioxide levels. So that is about your chronic bronchitis. What will be the picture of uh, clinical picture and as well as the chest x-ray. Now coming to the treatment. So treatment completely depends upon the level of your FEV1. So if the FEV1 level is reduced, but it is more than 80%, then you need to give short-acting beta agonist. If the level is in between 50 to 79%, then you need to give, you need to add long-acting beta agonist. Long-acting beta agonist will be your salmetrol or formetrol. Or you need to give anticholinergics. The anticholinergics will be ipratropium bromide or thiotropium bromide. And if the FEV1 is 30 to 49%, then you need to add the inhaled corticosteroids, okay? And if the FEV1 is less than 30%, you need to add the home oxygen. You need to give home oxygen. So this is what is your goal criteria. What is this goal criteria? Global initiative for obstructive lung disease. That is what is called as the goal criteria. So this completes the discussion of your COPD. That is your chronic bronchitis and as well as the emphysema. Then coming to your respiratory failure. So... So respiratory failure, we have totally four types, type 1, type 2, type 3, and as well as type 4. So type 1 respiratory failure is that these patients, they will have hypoxia and carbon dioxide levels, they may be reduced or normal. But what will happen to your A gradient, A gradient, alveolo-arterial oxygen gradient will be increased, right? Alveolo-arterial gradient of the oxygen will be increased. And in patients with your type 1 respiratory failure, please remember that is because of the alveolar fluid load, right? That is because of the alveolar fluid load. So what are the conditions where you can have type 1 uh, respiratory failure is in case of mild to moderate forms of the ARDS, you will have type 1 respiratory failure. In case of bronchial asthma, you will have type 1 respiratory failure, right? And in patients with emphysema, you will have your type 1 respiratory failure. And in patients with pneumonia, you can have type 1 respiratory failure. Type 2 respiratory failure is that these patients will have hypoxia and hypercapnia. And what will happen to your A gradient of the oxygen? That will remain normal. That will remain normal. And in case of your type 2 respiratory failure, please remember what are the causes? That will be alveolar hypoventilation. So what are the causes for your alveolar hypoventilation? The causes for your alveolar hypoventilation will be your central pathologies. What will be that central pathologies? That central pathologies will be in the form of your brainstem injury. And that can be seen in patients with your hypothyroidism. That can be seen associated with the drugs. And what are these particular drugs? These drugs include your opioid agonists, right? Opioids, they can cause the central respiratory depression. And neuromuscular causes like myasthenia gravis, motor neuron disease, glenn barry syndrome, okay? Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Hypokalemia, these all can cause your type 2 respiratory failure. Ultimately, you need to treat the individual, you need to treat the underlying cause, and you need to put the patient on mechanical ventilator. That will be treatment for your type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. And type 3 respiratory failure, this is nothing but your perioperative respiratory failure. Right? And where there is lung atelectasis. Okay? So the treatment in these individuals will be chest physiotherapy. But the one which will happen after the surgery, that will be your perioperative or postoperative respiratory failure will be your type 3 respiratory failure. And that is because of your skeletal muscle paralysis. That is because of your anesthetics or skeletal muscle relaxants, which have not recovered back. So for which you need to do chest physiotherapy and you need to change the position of the individual frequently, the right, the either right lateral side or left lateral side. And you need to put the patient on mechanical ventilator. Then you take type 4 respiratory failure. So type 4 respiratory failure is that, that is because of the cardiogenic shock. 
right? That is because of the cardiogenic shock. So whenever there is cardiogenic shock, what will happen is there will be decrease in the cardiac output. So thereby what will happen to respiratory muscle perfusion? Respiratory muscle perfusion can be decreased. So because of the decrease in respiratory muscle perfusion, there is respiratory failure. And that is what is your type 4 respiratory failure. And the treatment is you need to connect the patient to mechanical ventilator. And that will can increase the cardiac output by increasing the redistribution of the blood to your respiratory muscles. Okay. So that is about your types of respiratory failure okay type 1 type 2 type 3 and as well as type 4 okay so shall we have a short break here it's almost like three and a half hours over right so it is like continuously i'm teaching so we will just can we have just a small break okay so yes we'll just take a break for 10 or 15 minutes and then we will reassemble back and then complete the remaining topic of your respiratory system okay
All right. <clears throat> so the next important topic in the uh, pulmonology will be your bronchogenic carcinoma, right? So in the bronchogenic carcinoma, like the some important single liner questions will be the most common benign tumor of the lung. The most common benign tumor of the lung will be hamartoma, right? And what is the most common cause of the recurrent hemoptysis? The most common cause of the recurrent hemoptysis will be bronchial adenoma. Right? And what is the most common cause of cancer deaths among all the cancers? That will be your bronchogenic carcinoma, which is nothing but the lung cancer. And what is the most common risk factor for the development of bronchogenic carcinoma will be, it is smoking. And what is the most common natural risk factor or environmental pollutant? That will be exposure to the radon gas. And what is the most common rib which is affected in case of the pancos tumor? See, pancos tumor, it is very commonly seen in patients with the adenocarcinoma. Right? It is a tumor which is uh, growing at the apex of the lung that can destroy your first and second rib and that can also destroy cervical sympathetic chain that is CA, T1 and as well as T, T2. So the most common nerve roots which are affected in post uh, your pancoast that will be your CA, T1 and as well as T2. And because of that, these patients will have pain in the neck which will be radiating to the upper limbs. That is your pancos tumor, which is common in case of the adenocarcinoma. And it's a tumor which is originating from the apex of the lung. Then, what is the most frequent histological type? If nothing is given, if country is not given, then all over the world, the most common will be the adenocarcinoma. But the most frequent histological type in India, that will be the squamous cell carcinoma. right? And what is the most frequent histological type in non-smokers? That will be adenocarcinoma. And most frequent histological type in young individuals, that is also adenocarcinoma. And most frequent histological type in females, that will be also adenocarcinoma. And from the lung, what is the most common site of metastasis from the carcinoma of the lung? Most common site of metastasis from the carcinoma of the lung will be the liver. That is, from the lung, where it will go most commonly will be to the liver. And most common endocrine organ to be involved by the metastasis of the carcinoma of the lung will be adrenal gland, right? That will be the adrenal gland, right? Then followed by that, the carcinoma of the lung, which will metastasize to the opposite lung, that will be your adenocarcinoma. Okay, that will be adenocarcinoma. And most common tumor to metastasize to the heart, that will be your carcinoma lung, which will be commonly metastasizing to the heart. And what are the histological varieties that will cavitate? The one which will cavitate will be squamous cell carcinoma and as well as the large cell carcinoma. And the one which has the central end distribution, that will be your squamous cell carcinoma and then the small cell carcinoma. These two, they have central end distribution. The one with peripheral distribution will be adenocarcinoma. Whereas you take in case of large cell carcinoma, large cell, it has both the central distribution and as well as the peripheral distribution as well. And most common variety associated with the paraneoplastic syndrome. Most common variety associated with the paraneoplastic syndrome will be, that will be your small cell carcinoma of the lung, which is also nothing but your sport cell carcinoma. Okay. Now, what will be the paraneoplastic syndromes associated with the small cell carcinoma is, it can be associated with the development of Cushing's. It can be also associated with the development of the hyponatremia, right? And it can also be associated with the development of the hypocalcemia. That is because of increase in the calcitonin production, right? And uh, this is also associated with the development of the SAADH. So these are the endocrine manifestations that can be seen in patients with small cell carcinoma. So most commonly associated with hypokalemia is what? Small cell carcinoma. Why is that? That is because of ectopic ACTH production causing hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. And the one which is associated with the hypercalcemia will be squamous cell carcinoma. Why is that? Because squamous cell carcinoma will produce excess amount of parathormone and that will be causing your hypercalcemia, right? And the most common variety which is responding to your chemotherapy will be 
your small cell carcinoma. So small cell carcinoma, we don't do surgical resection. We need to give chemotherapy. Even though the prognosis is bad, right? Why the prognosis is bad in case of small cell carcinoma is it has a wide range of metastasis. Metastasis is very, very severe in patients with a small cell carcinoma. And what is the chemotherapy that we give in case of small cell carcinoma is the chemotherapy that you should give is etoposide plus cisplatin or we give carboplatin. Okay, etoposide plus cisplatin or carboplatin. That is what we will give for your small cell carcinoma. And the histological variety that uh, respond to your radiotherapy is also your small cell carcinoma, right? Because small cell carcinoma, we don't do surgery because it has a high metastasis. So either chemotherapy or radiotherapy, right? And histological variety with best prognosis will be your squamous cell carcinoma. And for squamous cell carcinoma, if at all, Right For squamous cell carcinoma, if at all, if you're giving chemotherapy, what is the chemotherapy that you need to give for squamous cell carcinoma is squamous cell carcinoma, you need to give paclitaxel plus carboplatin, right? Paclitaxel or carbo plus carboplatin, or you can give paclitaxel plus vincristin plus cisplatin. This will be the chemotherapy for squamous cell carcinoma. I'll repeat again for small cell carcinoma, it is etoposide plus carboplatin or the cisplatin. And for squamous cell carcinoma, it is paclitaxel plus carboplatin or paclitaxel plus vincristin plus cisplatin. So that will be the treatment for squamous cell carcinoma. And this is the one which has good prognosis. Whereas small cell carcinoma, if you see, it is the one with worse prognosis or bad prognosis. So that is about your bronchogenic carcinoma, all right? Then followed by that, you take the next important topic that is bronchial asthma. So bronchial asthma, if you observe, we have two forms of asthma, that is extrinsic asthma and as well as the intrinsic asthma. Extrinsic asthma is that where the atopy is present, whereas intrinsic asthma, atopy is absent. And uh, atopy means allergic manifestation. And in extrinsic asthma, it is observed in children. Whereas intrinsic asthma, it is present in adults, right? Extrinsic asthma, external allergen, it has a role. External allergen, the role is present, but external allergen role is absent in case of the intrinsic asthma. And family history is present in case of extrinsic asthma. Family history is absent in case of the intrinsic asthma. IgE levels and eosinophil levels are elevated in extrinsic asthma, normal in patients with the intrinsic asthma. Skin hypersensitivity test will be positive in case of your extrinsic asthma, normal in case of the intrinsic asthma. Provocative test like histamine challenge test, that will be positive in case of the extrinsic asthma. Provocative test, they are negative, right? Provocative test, they are negative in case of the intrinsic asthma, okay? So these are differences between extrinsic and as well as intrinsic asthma. And these patients, they have the clinical manifestation in the form of dyspnea. And along with cough, they have the sputum. And this particular sputum in patients with bronchial asthma, they have Kirschman spirals, which are nothing but spiral-shaped mucus plugs, right? They also have creola bodies, and they also have the charcoal-laden crystals. Charcoal-laden crystals, it will represent the eosinophils, okay? So they are pointed structures, and wherever there is hyper eosinophilia, there can be presence of your charcoal-laden crystals, okay? Then, these patients will also have Vs. Initially, what they will have is the expiratory Vs. But as the CVRT of asthma increases, these patients, they also have expiratory and as well as the inspiratory Vs together. That is what you will have in patients with the bronchial asthma. And if you see the variants of bronchial asthma, variants like you have the nocturnal asthma. So nocturnal asthma is that where the fall in your FEV1 level by evening will be more than 20%, right? When you compare the FEV1 level in the morning and as well as evening, the fall in the FEV1 level will be more than 20%, okay? And gastric variant of asthma, that is because of your GERD. Right immediately after food, these patients will have asthma. And the treatment that you need to give is proton pump inhibitors. Exercise induced asthma is that these patients, whenever they start the exercise, after 30 minutes of starting, starting exercise, they develop the asthma. Right? And by almost two hours, it reaches the peak value. 
it reaches the peak value. So what is that you need to do in these patients with exercise-induced asthma is, before starting the exercise itself, you need to give bronchodilators or you need to give steroid inhalation, and then you need to advise the individual to go ahead with the exercise. That is what is your exercise-induced asthma. Cardiac asthma is that seen in patients with the left ventricular failure causing pulmonary edema. This is what is called cardiac asthma. And drug-induced asthma, it is usually observed with the aspirin, right? Or it is usually observed with Cox inhibitors. Whenever, whenever you give these NSAIDs or aspirin, that will increase the leukotriene levels causing bronchoconstriction causing asthma. That is called drug-induced asthma. Status asthmaticus, it's a very severe form of asthma where your FEV1 levels will be less than 25%. And these patients, they can have silent chest. Why they can have silent chest? Because the bronchoconstriction is so severe, the air is not moving in and the air is not moving out. That is what is called status asthmaticus. And they have the characteristic pulse called as pulses paradoxes. And the respiratory rate in these individuals will be more than 30 per minute. And if you take the blood pressure of these individuals, they also have the hypotension, where the blood pressure will be less than 90 by 60. And they also have tachycardia, where the heart rate will be more than 100 per minute. And the drug of choice in case of the asthma, status asthmaticus is you need to give salbutamol nebulization and along with that intravenous hydrocortisone should be given in patients with the status asthmaticus. Then how will you diagnose these patients with the asthma? That is your pulmonary function test which will show you the obstructive lung disease pattern. And investigation of choice will be you need to demonstrate the reversibility pattern. What is that reversibility pattern? That is after giving uh, bronchodilators, right? After giving bronchodilators, there should be increase in your FEV1 levels. And how much should be that increase in FEV1 levels? The increase in FEV1 levels should be more than 12% or it should be more than 200 ml, right? Or it should be more than 200 ml. So that is what is your investigation of choice, which will have your reversibility testing. Then you take the CVRT of asthma is mainly based on your FEV1 levels. So in case of mild, the FEV1 will be more than 70%, whereas in moderate, the FEV1 will be more than 40 to 69%, whereas in severe, it will be more than, sorry, less than 40%. And in very severe, it is less than 25%. So that will be in case of very severe form of asthma. Then how do you treat? The treatment completely depends upon the severe CVRT. In case of mild intermittent, we just only give short-acting beta agonists. That too on the SOS basis. Whereas in case of mild persistent, these patients, along with the short-acting beta agonists, these patients, we, they also require the inhalational steroids. Right? They also require inhalational steroids. Whereas you take in case of moderate persistent form of asthma, these patients, along with the short-acting beta agonists, along with your the steroids, you also need to add, I mean, the steroids that you need to give is, see here, low-dose steroid should be given. And here the steroids that you give is, the high-dose steroid should be given through the inhalational route. That is in moderate persistent. Whereas in severe persistent, along with your the Saba or Laba, you also need to give oral steroids. And in all these patients, they require the leukotriene antagonists or they also require the mast cell stabilizers. Right? Leukotriene antagonists or mast cell stabilizers should be given in all of these patients. This will be using as only prophylaxis. These drugs will be using only as prophylaxis, not for the acute events. Okay, so this is about your bronchial asthma. So this completes this discussion of the bronchial asthma. Then, yeah, next we will move on to the discussion of the pulmonary function test in case of the respiratory system. Right, so if you take the pulmonary function test, you need to be very much aware of like, what is this instrument? This particular instrument, it is the spirometer, right? And this spirometer cannot measure certain lung functions. What are those? Residual volume cannot be measured by your spirometer. Total lung capacity cannot be measured by your spirometer. Functional residual capacity cannot be measured by your spirometer. So, you require body plethysmography for measurement of the residual volume and body plethysmography. 
right? You require body plethysmography and as well as, yeah, for the measurement of the total lung capacity, residual volume or the functional residual capacity. Now, if you take the pattern of pulmonary function test between obstructive and as well as restrictive, your FEV1, FVC, it is decreased in all of these patterns. But the only difference is your FEV1 by FVC. FEV1 by FVC will be decreased. That is less than 70% in case of obstructive. Whereas in restrictive pattern, it is increased. That is more than or equal to 70%. And forced mid-expiratory flow rate, that will be less than 50% of the predictive value in case of obstructive. Whereas in case of restrictive pattern also, that is being decreased. And you take the total lung capacity in obstructive pattern, it is normal or it is elevated. Whereas in restrictive pattern, it is decreased. What will happen to your diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide? It is usually normal in patients with obstructive pattern. Only in patients with emphysema, your DLCO will be reduced. Whereas DLCO you take in case of the restrictive pattern, it is decreased in case of the intrinsic type of lung pathologies. What will be the intrinsic like sarcoidosis? Then pneumoconiosis, interstitial lung disease, drug-induced fibrosis. These conditions, the your DLCO will be decreased. But it will remain normal in case of the extrinsic type of the restrictive lung disease. So the extrinsic, in a sense, like you take ankylosing spondylitis, obesity, kyphoscoliosis, that will be your extrinsic type of restrictive lung disease where your DLCO will be normal. Now, your pulmonary function test what is very, very important is the flow volume loops, right? So this is what is the normal flow volume loop, right? This is the normal flow volume loop. So this is the during inspiration and this is during the expiration. Now, please tell me, where do you have this particular scooped pattern? Yes, where is that you have this presence of the scooped pattern? So what is decrease here? It is mainly the expiratory portion which is being decreased. So the expiratory portion is being decreased in case of the obstructive lung disease where you have this scooped pattern, right? Then next you need to be very much aware of this particular flow volume curve. What does it show? Where only inspiration is being reduced. Whereas the expiration is like normal. You get this in the clinical scenarios of the variable extra thoracic obstruction and what will be that variable extra thoracic obstruction that is retrosternal goiter see in case of the retrosternal goiter right in case of the retrosternal goiter whenever the individual inhales the goiter moves down and it will compress the airway so inspiration will be reduced and during expiration the goiter moves up the expression will return back to normal. So in variable extrathoracic obstruction, you will have the inspiratory component being reduced. Then, yes, you see this. So in this scenario where the expression is being reduced, okay, so you get this in case of variable intrathoracic pattern that is laryngeal tumor. So in case of the laryngeal tumor, right, in case of this laryngeal tumor, so what happens is, this is like, sessi, I mean, sorry, pedunculated tumor. Whenever the air is moving in, right, this pedunculated pedunculate tumor, it is like reflected down. So the air goes in comfortably. So the inspiration will remain normal. But during expiration, what will happen? The During expiration, when the air is moving up, when the air is moving up, the tumor like will obstruct the airway, the expiration will be reduced. So that is what is nothing but your variable extra thoracic pattern where only the expression is being reduced, but the inspiration will remain normal. Okay, then what is the scenario where both expression is reduced and as well as the inspiration is also reduced? Both expression and exp inspiration both are reduced in case of the tracheal stenosis. So tracheal stenosis can occur because of the prolonged intubation. Right, because of prolonged intubation, you can have this, the uh, tracheal stenosis and where both inspiration and expression, both of them are reduced, okay? So this is about your, the respiratory patterns, okay? 
So whenever this lengthy question is given, what is that you need to do? You need to read the last line that you are very much aware of. Okay. So what is the most likely cause of the patient symptoms? If you read the last line, you are not going to get the answer here. So you need to read the entire thing. So I'll just give you the summary point here. The FEV1 by FVC ratio, it is 62.5%. How much is the normal value? 70%, right? So here it is 62.5%. So what do you think is the answer? And the next important point here is both the inspiratory curve is reduced and expiratory curve is also reduced. And what is this particular patient's history? This patient's history is that this patient history was like ARDS was there in the past and he required mechanical ventilation six weeks prior to his recovery. But the mechanical ventilator, what he required was for a prolonged period, right? Now, what do you think is this particular patient having? And this patient is also having low pitched inspiratory and as well as expiratory V's, which is being heard loudest over the mid chest area. So what is the diagnosis? Okay, so the diagnosis is that this patient is having subglottic stenosis, right? So just now we were discussing, right? If there is a fixed obstruction, and what could be the reason for subglottic stenosis? That is because of your intubation. Whenever there is a fixed obstruction, both inspiration and expiration, both will be reduced. Okay, so that is about your pulmonary function test. So where you will have like scooped pattern in case of the obstructive lung disease, where only inspiration is being reduced in case of variable extrathoracic obstruction, right? And only inspiration is being reduced, expiration being, sorry, expiration being reduced, the inspiration being normal, that is very uh, variable intrathoracic obstruction. Both inspiration and expiration both are reduced, that is in case of the tracheal stenosis, fixed airway obstruction, okay? Now, the next topic is the cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis, this is also a form of the obstructive lung disease. And the type of inheritance is an autosomal recessive type of inheritance. And the gene that is being mutated is the CFTR gene is being mutated. And this CFTR gene, it is present on the chromosome 7. And which component is being mutated? That is delta F508 mutation will be there. Okay. And the type of mutation will be deletion. So delta F508 deletion will be there. And what will be the clinical features? In Child, children or in the neonate, these patients, they present with meconium ileus, where the neonate will have the constipation, right? For which the treatment will be gastrographin enema, right? Gastrographin enema. Then respiratory manifestations because of the accumulation of the mucus within the respiratory airway, these patients will have pneumonia and they also develop bronchitis. They also develop bronchiectasis. And it is this pneumonia that will be the most common cause of death in patients with the cystic fibrosis. And these patients will also have infertility. And, okay, one more GAT manifestation in adults that you will have is these patients, they will have secondary biliary cirrhosis. Why? Because of the bile. It becomes like very solidified and it gets stasis. So there will be secondary biliary cirrhosis. And because of this secondary biliary cirrhosis, bile salts and bile pigments, they are not entering into your second part of the duodenum. So the, marsu um, the fermentation of your food products or the fats does not occur. And even the pancreatic juice is also being solidified because of which they will develop osmotic diarrhea because digestion of the food particles does not occur. And because the food particles are not being digested, the fluid is secreted into the GAT resulting in the osmotic diarrhea. Infertility will be there in these patients and this particular infertility and there will be like azospermia, right? Why there will be azospermia in case of males? Azospermia in case of males, that is because of your agenesis of the vas difference, right? Because of agenesis of vas difference. And in females also, they have infertility, and that is because of increase in the cervical mucus thickness. Right, increase in the cervical mucus thickness. And what is the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice is you need to do CFTR gene analysis. 
and the another important test will be your sweat chloride test sweat chloride test will be elevated and how much will be that sweat chloride more than 60 how much is the normal value normal value is less than 30 right normal value is less than 30 but in these individuals the sweat chloride will be more than 60 but the investigation of choices cftr gene mutation analysis should be done then coming to the treatment in these individuals the mucus is very thick you need to give hypertonic saline 7% sodium chloride should be given mainly to liquefy the sputum. And then you need to give inhalational recombinant DNAs. This inhalational recombinant DNAs is being given that is mainly to liquefy the sputum and exhale the sputum out. And antibiotics should be given because the pneumonia is very common in these patients. Then you need to give the CFTR targeted therapy, CFTR trafficking. That is the targeted therapy that will modulate the CFTR trafficking. And what is that example of your CFTR regulators will be your IVA cafter. Right? IVA cafter. We have many cafters. One is your IVA cafter, Luma cafter, Pisa cafter, Elixa cafter. These are all the cafters. Okay? So this will be your treatment and complete discussion related to your cystic fibrosis. Okay? Then, Coming to your bronchiectasis, the last topic, I think. So the bronchiectasis, this is also a form of, yeah, and tuberculosis is their last topic, right? So bronchiectasis, this is also a form of the obstructive lung disease where the medium-sized airways are affected. So medium-sized airways in the sense, out of these 23 generations, Fifth to ninth generation is abnormally irreversibly dilated. And what are the conditions where you have upper low bronchiectasis? That is in case of tuberculosis and as well as cystic fibrosis and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Mid-lung bronchiectasis is observed in case of mycobacterium avium intracellular. Lower lung bronchiectasis, it is seen in case of the chronic recurrent aspiration. Right, chronic recurrent aspiration. Now, what do you understand by this word bronchiectasis sicca? Usually, in case of bronchiectasis, there is copious amount of expectoration. Large volume of the sputum is being produced. But bronchiectasis sicca is nothing but dry bronchiectasis. There is no sputum production at all. So you get this in case of the tuberculosis. In tuberculosis, you can have this bronchiectasis sicca. Then Brooks syndrome. Brooks syndrome is mid-lung bronchiectasis. This mid-lung bronchiectasis is seen in patients with primary pulmonary tuberculosis, right? And what is the treatment? Okay, first of all, how do you diagnose these patients with the bronchiectasis is the investigation of choice is HRCT. But the other investigations that you will come across in patients with the bronchiectasis is when you take the sputum, you will have three-layered sputum accumulation in bronchiectasis. The upper lobe will be formed, middle lobe, like middle layer will be a mucopurulent material and the lower will be completely pus or mucus production will be there. Then you take the chest x-ray. Chest x-ray will show you the classical tram track appearance because your bronchi are abnormally dilated. Within this abnormally dilated bronchi, you have C-shaped rings, right? And then the investigation of choice will be your HRCT. So HRCT will show you the tree in bud appearance that you get mainly in case of the cystic bronchiectasis or you get this classical signet ring sign in case of the HRCT. That is what is the picture in patients with the bronchiectasis. And for visualizing the bronchi, right, for visualizing the bronchi and planning the treatment you need to do, the bronchography and the most common shape of your bronchiectasis will be cylindrical bronchiectasis. Cylindrical bronchiectasis is the most common form of the bronchiectasis. All right. Then how do you treat these patients? See, treatment in patients with bronchiectasis, the most common cause is pneumonia and tuberculosis. So you need to give antibiotics in these patients. Then you need to do chest physiotherapy. Why is that you need to do chest physiotherapy? To ensure that the entire mucus is being completely expelled out, right? And the next important is you need to do surgery. But when will you, when will you do surgery? Surgery you will be able to do only if there is localized bronchiectasis, right? If it is localized bronchiectasis, you can do the surgical resection.
Right. So only in case of localized bronchiectasis, you need to do surgery. But if there is diffuse bilateral bronchiectasis, right, if there is diffuse bilateral bronchiectasis, in such case, please remember, you need to plan for lung transplantation. So that is about your bronchiectasis story. Okay. So mainly you need to know which are your upper lobe, mid lung and lower lobe. What is bronchiectasis sicca? What is Brooks syndrome? Investigation of choice will be your HRCT and treatment will be your antibiotics, chest physiotherapy. And these patients will also have hemoptysis, right? There can be massive hemoptysis. And if there is massive hemoptysis, you need to do bronchial artery embolization, right? You need to do bronchial artery embolization. So that is what is your bronchiectasis story, okay? Then followed by the bronchiectasis, the last topic for the discussion will be your tuberculosis. So in case of tuberculosis, you need to know that what are the various modes of transmission of the tuberculosis? One is definitely your inhalation route. Next is the ingestion. So the sputum containing tubercle bacilli, the individual ingest, then the individual can develop gastrointestinal tuberculosis. And mainly the structure which gets affected is ileum. So vertical transmission is that where the organism will transmit from the mother to the fetus. And the gons focus will be mainly formed within the liver in case of the fetus when there is vertical transmission. Direct contact is nothing but your skin tuberculosis, right? And this skin tuberculosis is nothing but your lupus vulgaris, right? Lupus vulgaris, okay? Then coming to the differences between primary and secondary tuberculosis. So primary tuberculosis is that where the individual is exposed to the organism for the first time. Whereas secondary tuberculosis is that the latent tuberculous organism, whichever is there, that will get activated Right, that we get activated mainly in case of the immunosuppressive agents like HIV infected individual patients who are on steroid therapy and patients who are on chemotherapy. And in case of primary tuberculosis, more than 95% of individuals, they are asymptomatic. Only less than 5% of individuals where the immunity is not good, only these patients, they develop the symptoms. Only these patients, they develop the symptoms. Okay, whereas in case of the secondary tuberculosis, in secondary tuberculosis, Majority of them are symptomatic and cavity formation, it is the hallmark of your secondary tuberculosis. And you need to know the GONS focus. In primary tuberculosis, the GONS focus will be formed in a uh, most common site will be the lower part of the upper lobe, right? Or upper border of the middle lobe. Okay. So lower part lower border of the upper lobe or upper border of the middle lobe if it is in the right lung. Whereas in the secondary tuberculosis, the most common site for the GONS focus will be in the apex, right? And how will you diagnose your tuberculosis? The, the investigation of choice is the gene expert, right? Where this gene expert will show you the presence of the TB-PCR, right? And it will also give you if there is any resistance to your rifampicin. Right? If there is any resistance to rifampicin, the gene expert will tell you. Interferon gamma, this is very much useful for latent tuberculosis. We do what is called quantiferon gold test. So quantiferon gold test, where the interferon gamma will be positive. And the treatment, first line anti-tubercular drugs will be your isoniazid, rifampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, and then streptomycin. Right, and then streptomycin. Okay, for the uh, isoniazid, that is your H. And please remember, all your all are your hepatotoxic drugs except your ethambutol. Ethambutol is not hepatotoxic, but if you take the adverse effects, your isoniazid will cause the peripheral neuropathy, for which you need to give pyridoxine whenever you are giving isoniazid. Rifampicin will cause the orange-colored urination. Ethambutol will cause retrobulbar neuritis, where there can be blindness also. And your pyrazinamide will cause the hyperuricemia and can precipitate the gout or gouty arthritis. And your streptomycin will cause nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, and as well as the neurotoxicity. That is with streptomycin. And what are your second-line anti-tubercular drugs? Second-line anti-tubercular drugs are your aminoglycosides, right? That is your amikacin and as well as canamycin. Then you have polypeptides. Examples of polypeptides will be capriomycin, viomycin, and as well as enviomycin. Then you have the fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones are ciprofloxin, levofloxin, and moxifloxin. Then you have thionamides, right? These particular thionamides will be your ethionamide and as well as prothionamide, okay? That will be your second-line anti-tubercular drugs. So aminoglycosides, amikacin, and canamycin. Polypeptides will be capriomycin, enviomycin, and viomycin. 
Fluoroquinolones will be ciprofloxin, levofloxin, moxifloxin. Thionamides will be ethionamide and as well as prothionamide. Then, what do you understand by this word? MDR tuberculosis. MDR tuberculosis is that where the organism is resistant to isoniazid and as well as rifampicin. That is what is called the MDR tuberculosis. Then what do you understand by this word? The XDR tuberculosis. The XDR tuberculosis is that where the individual is resistant to majority of your first line anti-tubercular drugs. Right? All your first line anti-tubercular drugs they, and not only that this particular XDR tuberculosis, it will not only tell you that the, the organism is resistant to your first-line anti-tubercular drugs, it is also resistant to one of the injectable second-line anti-tubercular drug. Now, what will be that injectable second-line anti-tubercular drugs? Mainly your canamycin, that is an injectable drug. Capramycin, injectable drug. And one fluoroquinolone. Okay, and one injectable drug. Okay, so that will be your XDR tuberculosis. That is nothing but your extended drug resistant tuberculosis, right? And what will be the gene mutations for the development of resistance is rifampicin resistance, RPOB gene mutation within the organism, and pyrazinamide resistance, your PNCA gene mutation, and INH resistance, that is INHA gene mutation. And you need to know the focus, right? That is Gon's focus. What do you mean by the word pulse lesion? Pulse lesion is that where there will be supraclavicular, right? Supraclavicular focus. Whereas asthma fo focus will be the infraclavicular focus, that is Gon's focus. We get will be caseating metastatic focus in the pulmonary veins. Simon focus will be the calcified focus within the apex. Rich focus is that where you have the tubercular meningitis. Simon's focus is that where you have the focus within the liver. Ponset's disease, that is the arthritis. Right? That will be your arthritis. Okay? So, that will be your various names depending upon where will be the sites of your GANS focus. Then, you need to know about the miliary tuberculosis. So, miliary tuberculosis is that where it can follow the primary and as well as the secondary tuberculosis, where the chest X-ray will show you the lesions will be, which will be similar to that of millet seeds. And that is the reason why it is called as the miliary tuberculosis. And the organism from the lung, they are spread to the distant sites by hematogenous roots. Okay? By hematogenous root, they are being spread to the distant sites. And that is the reason why the sputum smear is negative in almost 80% of patients. And the organs which are commonly affected will be liver, then spleen, and then kidney. These are the organs which are commonly affected by your miliary tuberculosis. And this we call it as the classical snowstorm appearance. And what are the differential diagnoses for snowstorm appearance? You get that in case of tuberculosis, silicosis, hemosidrosis, varicella zoster pneumonia, and pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. These are all the conditions where you have this snowstorm appearance. Then next is the tuberculin test, which is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And what should be, how, when do you consider it as positive? The erythematous lesion, that should be more than 10 mm. But in which conditions even 5 to 10 mm is considered positive? That is immunosuppressed patients, HIV, elderly individuals, then in patients who are like having malnutrition or in children, even 5 to 10 mm is considered to be positive. Otherwise, it should be more than 10 mm, the tuberculin test, that should be positive. Okay. And it's a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, right? Then next is the microscopy, sputum smear microscopy. The type, the stains that we use is ZN stain, Zeal Nielsen stain. And the next important is the oramine rhodamine stain. And how many bacilli should be there uh, per ml to consider the sputum smear to be uh, positive? More than 10,000 bacilli should be there per 1 ml of the sputum to consider the sputum should be positive, right? Then next is the culture media. What is the culture media for the tuberculosis? That is Lowenstein's Jensen's media. But the Lowenstein's Jensen's media, it will take almost four to six weeks for it to be positive. So that is the reason why we don't depend on the Lowenstein's Jensen's media. Lowenstein's Jensen's media, right? It will give you a late diagnosis. So that is the reason why, what is the investigation of choice now? The investigation of choice will be your TB-PCR, which is nothing but your CD-NAT. 
okay which is nothing but your cartridge based cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test which is nothing but your gene expert right but not we don't depend on we don't depend on the lg media or lovenstein genesis media because the result what it gives is after a very long time so this completes your respiratory system topics all the topics in the respiratory systems are uh, in the respiratory system is being covered right so this session the first session part 1 i'll wind up today tomorrow at 5 o'clock i will start with the cardiology so cardiology neurology connective tissue disorders gastroenterology we will discuss that tomorrow okay so thank you very much and see you tomorrow at 5 pm and this pdf with annotations i'll be posting on tel my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh gupta and even dr bhanu prakash uh, telegram channel as well thank you very much see you tomorrow again